Um, welcome to the Monitor Natural Attenuation Guidance Document and Groundwater Remedial Action Permit Training. Um, I'm Jillian Schwert. I'm one of the moderators today. I'm here with uh, Liz Ayers, who is my co-moderator. Um, we're going to get started. We have a pretty full um, training today, so we're going to try to keep, keep up. Um, next slide. This slide provides the contact information um, for questions regarding the Monitor Natural Attenuation Guidance Document, as well as the Groundwater Remedial Action Permit, permit Guidance Document. Next slide, please. Continuing education credits today, the SRP Licensing Board has approved 2.5 technical and one regulatory CEC for this training class. As a reminder, you must stay logged into the entire session and answer three out of the four poll questions. Next slide, please. CEC process. Since the SRPL Licensing Board has approved CECs for the course, um, DEP will compile a list of webinar participants eligible for CECs and provide a list to the LSR, LSRPA. LSRPA will email eligible participants a link to a web page with certi certificate access instructions. Certificates will then be is issued by the LSRPA after paying a $25 processing fee. Next slide. So here's an example of one of the test your knowledge questions. Um, as Liz said, there will be four questions today. You have to answer three out of four. You do not have to get them right. So when a poll question comes up, one of us, either Liz or myself, will read it. So m &A stands for A, mostly not attenuated, B, monitored natural attenuation, or C, might never attenuate. The poll question will be up for one full minute to give you an opportunity to answer it. There will be a pop-up on your screen. Please do not ans um, enter your answers in the chat or in the questions box. Um, answer it on the pop-up screen. If you have any technical difficulties, uh, please leave a comment in the chat box and someone will try to assist you. Um, next, next slide. So the answer is B, it stands for monitored natural attenuation. Next slide. So um, there will be several question and answer segments during the training today. Um, questions will be read aloud by either myself or Liz as time permits. Any questions that don't get um, asked and answered during the presentation will be answered in the weeks um, following the training via email directly to the, whoever asked the question. Um, so if we run out of time, we don't ask your question, don't worry, you will get an answer. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, please use the chat function only to advise the department of any technical issues you may have with the presentation, such as your sound isn't working or, or something to that effect, the poll question didn't work for you, whatever. Use the chat function for that, not the question function. Um, also, please don't answer any attendees' questions via the chat function. It just muddies up the waters for anybody who may need technical support. Next question, or next slide. Um, and as always, we have a poll for you to fill out after the um, presentation today, located at this link um, at SurveyMonkey. We will put it in the chat for you. Please do fill out the survey for us. It really helps us know what we did right, what we did wrong, what you're looking for for future trainings, and all that good stuff. All right, next slide. Okay, and with that, I will welcome Mark Fisher to talk about some LSRPA stuff. Mark, if you're here. I'm here. Wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just a few quick uh, announcements relative to the LSRPA. Uh, first, I want to welcome everybody to this training session. We uh, at the LSRPA uh, have a long-standing tradition of partnering with the department to do these training sessions, uh, particularly when guidance documents come out and for some other special topics. So uh, this is sort of a continuation of that, uh, that collaborative relationship we have with the DEP. Next slide, please. Uh, all the great things that the association gets to do for our membership, uh, in part, is the result of our funding from our sponsors. Uh, we have several tiers of sponsors. The ones on the screen are our top tier, our diamond partners. Take a look and enjoy. Next slide, please. Second tier, we have gold partners. Quite a few of those. Probably recognize a lot of these. 
friends and colleagues. Next slide. And lastly, our silver partners. Next slide, please. A couple other uh, announcements uh, with uh, regard to LSRPA courses and events. We have an aspiring professional series. That's an ongoing series that our aspiring professionals uh, committee put on throughout the year. Uh, this is uh, sessions two and three of a continuing uh, session regarding uh, understanding risks and liabilities. Actually, this is um, and uh, it's a great. These are great sessions for not only aspiring professionals but actually anybody in our industry. So these are really important topics, and you'll actually find, even though there are. Uh, some of these sessions are billed through the Aspiring Professional Series. They're actually, like I said, great topics for, for everybody uh, at any level of experience. So next slide, please. A few others, we have uh, regulatory roundtables every month. Uh, this month in February, we're gonna have a talk on uh, remedial action work plans. Um, later in the month of February, we have a couple other training sessions, one on GIS and another one, there's a collaborative session with BCO and LSRPA, SWEP, and the New Jersey CBP. Uh, it's for women in environmental construction, architectural, and engineering professions, so that should be a good one. Next slide. And lastly, uh, to stay connected with us, you know, by all means, uh, become a member, obviously, and uh, check us out on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. Those are our links there. Next slide. That's it for me. Enjoy the uh, training session today, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Um, so next up, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Alexander Shakaniza from the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting, and he will be giving us a background and introduction on monitored natural attenuation guidance document. Hey, uh, thank you. Hey, yep. Uh, Al Shakaniza here with the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting. So I am one of the two chairpersons for the M&A guidance document. Uh, so I'll just get us started off with the training. Uh, next slide, please. So the M&A Stakeholder Committee was formed in 2010 uh, with the purpose to provide detailed technical information on the use of M&A as a remedial action for sites with contaminated groundwater in the state of New Jersey. Uh, the M&A Guidance Stakeholder Committee reconvened in 2020 to update the document since it hadn't been updated since 2012. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a full list of all the stakeholder committee members that were involved with the updates to the M&A guidance document. So I'm not going to list them all out, but I would like to uh, thank them as they all put in a lot of time and effort to get this guidance document updated. One second. Right, next slide, please. All right, so yeah, the original document came out in 2012, and then our updated document just came out in September of 2022. The biggest changes to the document include, uh, I would say the biggest change was definitely the addition of the non-decreasing levels of groundwater contamination section, section 6.1.2.4, and that was a section of the guidance document that was originally in the department's REO guidance document. <laughs> person won't stop calling. Um, and we found it was more of an administrative, uh, that was an administrative guidance document where this is a technical guidance document. So uh, we felt that the section was better suited for this M&A guidance document. We could expand on the technical aspect of it a little bit more. Uh, other changes to the guidance document include clarifying that the primary line of evidence should include both a reducing plume boundary and reducing contaminant concentrations or mass, and clarifying that M&A samples that, s sampling that is collected to support M&A as a final remedial action, they should be collected once the aquifer has had time to reach an equilibrium, which will take different amounts of times depending on which active remedial action is selected. Uh, next slide, please. I believe that's all I had. So uh, you'll see me all 
a bit later in the training. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Al. Um, all right. Next up, we're going to welcome Michael Gaudio, our Bureau Chief of Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting, to talk about the Groundwater Wrap Guidance document, give you some intro information. Mike, if you're here. There you are. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say good morning, everyone. I just want to welcome everyone to the uh, combined m and and Groundwater Wrap Guidance document training today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Gaudio, and I'm the new Bureau Chief for the Bureau of Meal Action Permitting. I'm also the uh, chairperson for the uh, RAP Stakeholder uh, Committee. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide gives you a little background on the uh, RAP Stakeholder Committee that was formed uh, back in 2017. Uh, it consists of the NJDEP, LSRPs, uh, responsible parties, and the LSRPA. Um, the department meets with the stakeholders about two times a month, so we've accomplished a lot meeting there frequently, as well as uh, gotten to know each other pretty well. Uh, our purpose is to identify ways to make uh, the RAP process more transparent, efficient, and effective. Uh, a big part of accomplishing that goal is to revising our forms, uh, our guidance documents, as well as making any recommended uh, rule changes if appropriate. Um, some of the RAP Stakeholders uh, Committee's accomplishments to date are that we uh, created the new soil and groundwater RAP application forms in, in May of 2019. Uh, we also updated the soil and groundwater remedial action uh, protecting this BICERP forms, uh, and that was in May 2021, as well as most recently we revised the soil RAP guidance document in uh, May 2022. Um, our most recent uh, accomplishment is, is the completion of this groundwater wrap guidance document, which uh, the RAP stakeholder committee began work on that in uh, November of 2021. Uh, next slide, please. All right, here's the list of the uh, RAP stakeholder committee members. I just want to you know, say thank you to everyone for all your hard work in, in getting this done and everything you've done to get us to this point. Uh, also wanted to thank uh, everyone in the NJDP who provided comment on this document. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's some uh, background on the Groundwater Wrap Guidance document. Uh, as you can see, this guidance document uh, was last updated about five years ago. Um, We've updated the, the guidance document to clearly indicate when a groundwater wrap application should be submitted and by whom. Um, it's to, designed to assist the user in, in navigating the various steps in the groundwater wrap process. Um, and, and most importantly, we made sure that this guidance document addresses the common uh, administrative and technical deficiencies that permit reviewers have when they're uh, reviewing a groundwater wrap application. Um, and also that we, we updated the format of the guidance document to conform with other uh, NJDEP guidance documents. Um, and as you'll see on the next slide, there's uh, new sections and appendices, and some of the existing uh, sections were updated and expanded. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and here's, this slide shows you some quick highlights to the groundwater wrap guidance document. As you can see, um, you know, here's, this is the table of contents from the groundwater wrap guidance document. The highlighted sections are all new sections. Uh, the non-highlighted non sections were significantly expanded and updated. Um, as, you can, as you can see, there's a new CEA section that was that has helpful tips in it, as well as a, a new appendix one. Uh, which is a model table for historic groundwater sampling results by modern well, which I'll have a slide on later um, to discuss. Um, it's also worth noting that the uh, FA section was significantly expanded and uh, Mike Infanger and Chad Smith will go into this later on in the training. Next slide, please. And I just wanna say thank you and I hope everyone enjoys the training today. Thanks, Mike. Um, we'll move on. Um, 
Next presenter is Steve Poston, WSP USA Environment and Infrastructure, giving us a um, little tour of monitor natural attenuation lines of evidence. Hello, everybody. Um, so I guess at this point, we're actually going to get into the meat of the various um, guidance documents. And uh, I'll just point out that uh, along with Alex, I was the, uh, the co-chair of the preparation of this document uh, going back to 2010 timeframe. Okay, next slide. So in the uh, collection of data to establish um, that you've got monitored natural attenuation working at your site, there's a couple of levels of analysis that you can perform. And it's, it's really kind of based on how uh, complex your site is or how variable your data is. But, um, you know, in most cases, the primary line of evidence is what you'll be working with. And that's really just, um, you know, looking at how your contaminant uh, concentrations change over time and with distance. And as indicated, uh, this table two from the document uh, it just kind of gives you a brief overview of what these different uh, lines of evidence represent. And as I said, uh, you don't really need to get into the secondary or tertiary lines of evidence unless you've got, um, you know, kind of uh, complex or variable situations at your site. Next slide, please. So for the primary line of evidence, uh, there's a couple of things that you want to establish. And the first um, is that your, your plume, the dimensions of your plume are either uh, stable or shrinking. So clearly you don't want an expanding plume, which would be an indication that, you know, the natural processes in the ground um, aren't able to, um, you know, reduce the uh, or destroy your contaminants. So one of the two things that you need to do is establish that, you know, your the uh, geographic extent of your plume is either uh, shrinking or it's stable. Next slide, please. And then there's uh, quite a few options um, that you can look at to, you know, determine or uh, document the trends in uh, contaminant concentration or mass. And usually, uh, you know, use graphical or spatial analysis, and, and we're going to go into some examples of these. <clears throat> but, you know, there's also, even at this level, there's more sophisticated lines of evidence that you can establish. And there's all a range of statistical analyses you can apply to your data. <clears throat> we're not going to get into those, but um, there's an appendix in the guidance document that, that covers most of the common ways of doing that. Uh, mass, mass flux and mass discharge, you know, relatively new approach um, where you have multiple sampling depths across transects in your plume. And really, you don't need this unless you've got a site maybe with many multiple lenses or layers with contaminants in them that you need to monitor. Or, you know, maybe you're at the uh, property boundary the down gradient edge of your site maybe bounds up against, you know, 16 lanes of the, uh, the turnpike. So you've got no good way of getting further down gradient data. So you need to collect, you know, much more uh, at that location. So again, not going to get into mass flux and mass discharge really here, but there is uh, an appendix that, um, that goes into that. So in terms of graphical analysis, you've got the basic plots of concentration versus time. And, you know, of course, what you want to see is there's a decrease over time. You can also plot concentration with distance with down gradient monitoring wells. And you can use these data to define degradation rate constants, um, you know, which are important, um, not only from like a CEA perspective, but also uh, from your permitting perspective in terms of estimating the time frame to achieve uh, groundwater quality standards. <clears throat> and if you're going to do that kind of stuff, I've got a red asterisk there. There's a couple of um, really basic documents that you should read. Uh, not that the concept of determining things is that difficult, but there's always issues with units and how you present data. And, 
super important to look at those two uh, references to make sure you've uh, got that laid out right. And we've got a couple uh, analyses of uh, spatial analysis as well, which look at um, you know situations that really verify that you've got uh, biodegradation occurring at your site. And then also a method to look at your entire plume uh, and all of the con uh, concentration data you have so that you can look at a, a mass of the entire contaminant plume instead of just relying on what's happening at individual monitoring wells. Next slide, please. So these are um, some graphs from the guidance document. And again, on the left is just the uh, pretty classic concentration versus time. Um, you know, at individual monitoring wells that are showing that it's got to decrease over time, which is what you need to show. And then the graph at, on the right just provides a little more information. So it's, um, you know, individual monitoring wells, but how their uh, concentrations change both with time and with distance. You know, and again, what you want to be seeing is um, um, lines that decrease over time. <coughs> Next slide, please. So here's an example of, of some um, <coughs> monitoring data from an actual site. And these actually a little more sophisticated. They've got some error bars and you can see with the red ovals that those uh, degradation rate constants um, have been estimated. Uh, one thing I point out is that well on the on the top left that MW11D is a location where an offsite source was documented, so that's why you see that kind of crazy pattern up there. But you know, in terms of the other wells on site, they're pretty stable or, or you know pretty clearly show a decreasing trend. Excuse me. Next slide, please. So this is an example where, hey, uh, excuse me for a minute, I'm suffering with a cold here. But <clears throat> where you can use modeling to document that um, you've got degradation occurring at your site. So in this case, the August 1993 case, if your site um, several years later actually looked the same as it did in 1993, it would be an indication that you've got biodegradation occurring in the plume. So what's happening here is a, a groundwater model <clears throat> bioscreen is being used. Um, and what it's doing is you can turn biodegradation on or off. And then what's displayed here in July 94 and September 95 is biodegradation is turned off. And so you can see how the plume would expand if there was no uh, biodegradation occurring in the aquifer. But if your site conditions in 95 looked the same as they did in 1993, it's pretty good evidence that biodegradation is occurring because your plume is not expanding. And if you're going to do this kind of modeling, you need to collect a little more information um, you know, during your site investigation phase, you know, which includes things like in addition to hydraulic conductivity and hydraulic gradient, which is stuff that you're going to generate site-specific information for regardless, but you also need to look at things like porosity and organic carbon content because these are the things or inputs that you need to put into the model, uh, you know, to make sure that it will accurately reflect your site conditions. Next slide, please. And this is an example of the, uh, <clears throat> the kind of the whole plume mass analysis. So on the left, you see the typical contour map of concentrations. And you can kind of visualize that if that was, um, um, you know, converted into a volume, right? So like uh, topography, you'd have this actual mass or volume of area that represents con uh, the concentrations and by <clears throat> you know multiplying uh, that mass or that concentra concentration distribution by the geographic area of the uh, of the plume and then multiplying it by the aquifer thickness and porosity etc you can convert that concentration data into a mass and so 
you know, in this case here in the first quarter of 2017, there's a mass of something like 0.8 kilograms. Next slide, please. In 2020, same kind of analysis, and the mass of the entire plume has been reduced to something like 0.5 kilograms. So, again, just a, <clears throat> just a way to use all of the data uh, that you're collecting. In some cases, you can have concentrations bouncing up and down at individual monitoring wells, but you know, if you integrate all of the data, you can get a better picture of what's happening uh, across the entire plume. Next slide, please. All right, Steve, I'll, I'll jump in here and interrupt. This is our first test your knowledge question. Um, like we said before, there will be four questions throughout the training. This is the first one, and you have to answer three out of four. So um, the question reads, spatial analysis is a primary line of evidence. A, true, or B, false? You will see the um, options to answer pop up on your screen now. This will be up for a minute. Um, while you're answering that, I'll just uh, provide a couple of uh, um, reminders. Uh, please do fill out our survey um, after the training to let us know how we did, let us know what was good, what was bad, what you would have us do next time. That would be really helpful. Um, also, in order to get CECs today, you do have to remain logged in for the entire training. Um, we do have a fully booked up training today, so please stay logged in. It's possible if you left, you might not be able to get back in. Um, and just some um, things to look out for in the future. Uh, the Field Sampling Procedures Manual, chapters five through nine, um, we will probably have a training for that maybe in July or August. Um, and besides that, we will have our Rutgers case study training in June. We're putting that training on twice, um, June 7th and 8th, and then June 14th and 15th. So if that interests you, or if you need that, um, please do register. All right, so time's up, and the answer is, next slide, true. Okay, Steve, back to you. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> All right, so the, <clears throat> the secondary line of evidence relates to looking at geochemical uh, indicators that you would sample from your monitoring wells. And this uh, slide here just gives you an overview of the kinds of you know, biological degradation processes that will occur. And it, you know, the, the kind of processes and pathways vary a little bit in terms of whether you're looking at uh, things like chlorinated solvents uh, or fuels. But there's, uh, regardless, there's a range of um, <clears throat> indicators uh, that can be measured that would support the evidence of uh, biodegradation in the ground. At the bottom right there, I've got a link to a page that um, <clears throat> you probably haven't heard of, but it's uh, a site that's um, overseen by a series of universities that are heavily into uh, research related to the environmental sciences, and they provide really good overview of just about every topic um, that we're involved with not only in site remediation, but uh, many aspects of the environmental sciences. And I'd uh, encourage you to check it out when you get a chance. Next slide. So this is kind of a classic uh, subsurface representation of what happens um, in a fuel spill. And uh, as you can see, there's all kinds of processes that would develop in terms of in situ biodegradation. <laughs> so at the leading edge of the plume, you would have aerobic respiration. Um, so what's happening there is, you know, microorganisms are depleting oxygen as they chew up the, um, the fuel chemicals. And as oxygen gets depleted, different strains of bacteria start getting into different degradation processes. So there's denitrification, in where nitrate is reduced to nitrate. Um, you've got manganese and iron reduction, where ferric iron, as an example, is reduced to ferrous iron. Sulfate reduction, sulfate reduced to sulfite, and methanogenesis, which um, generates uh, a, a byproduct of methane. And so all of these processes have indicators that can be measured. Uh, next slide. 
And this is a um, helpful table that's contained in the guidance document, which basically describes those, um, you know, terminal electron acceptors, which parameters you look for to um, uh, document these processes, you know, and what's happening in those processes. And what I did is I highlighted in yellow, those are field measure parameters and tend to be the uh, easiest and most direct indicators of, um, you know, what's happening in the ground in terms of degradation. Methane is also a um, very good indicator. It's, uh, it's got a red arrow because in that case, you actually have to send the sample to the lab. But, um, you know, these are the kind of <clears throat> things you want to measure uh, and establish to um, build the case of, of biodegradation or you know, natural attenuation processes incurring in the subsurface. Next slide, please. So tertiary, excuse me for a second, uh, tertiary lines of evidence, uh, there's, you know, a range of tools that can be applied. In this case here, we're looking at um, microbiological tools. So instead of indicators, which, you know, uh, geochemistry would would play a role there. We're actually looking at quantifying the um, you know bacterial populations, and so there's various companies that perform this kind of analysis and document you know which kinds of bacteria you have in the ground, and it's not only bacteria, but it's the uh, the functional genes within the bacteria. Um, that perform certain functions. So, for, for example, uh, the reduction of vinyl chloride to ethene. And so the idea is <clears throat> that you take samples, um, you can actually use these things called biotraps now that you, you know, you put into your well and they sit there for a while and you pull them out and send them to the specialty lab. But what you're trying to do is see, you know, high populations of the bacteria that um, are going to degrade the kinds of chemicals that you have on your site. And just as a quick example here, you can see MWX and MWY, and um, you know the the, uh, the y axis is um, you know concentration magnitude. So the higher the population of the specific bacteria you have in your well or at your site, you know the better you're going to have. Um, a chance for the uh, microbial degradation. So this is important stuff. Um, you know, again, <clears throat> not looking at, at indicators as you would with the with the with the secondary line of evidence, but the actual um, you know populations of microorganisms that are going to degrade your your um, contaminants. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> So a second um, approach is, is to use compound-specific isotope analysis. And I guess in order to, you know, remotely comprehend what a graph of the data might look like, you have to step through a little bit um, just what all this stuff means. So, so this slide is like a basic introduction into, um, you know, what CSIA is all about. Um, so you're looking at different isotopes of elements. Uh, we're not looking at radioactive isotopes. We're looking at different stable isotopes. Uh, next slide, please. And, you know, the, the isotopes have their own, um, you know, specific way of being presented in terms of concentration. So the isotopes, you know, their, their quantity is extremely tiny, um, you know, in the molecule compared to the standard um, concentration of the normal or common isotope. And so, you know, a different way of expressing the data has been developed, which basically is comparing what you have to, uh, you know, kind of a international standard and then basically looking at a ratio between what's in your result and the standard. And it just basically makes the numbers a little more meaningful than, you know, dealing with values 
you know, 10 to the minus 20th or something. Um, and in this case here, we're looking at, you know, if you had a kind of a virgin sample of PCE in a drum from, you know, a factory manufacturer, and you were to analyze the um, uh, carbon-13 ratio, what you would find is your uh, concentration would be what's, you know, called, you know, minus 29 per mil, so 2.9% lower than what you would find in the international standard. Uh, next slide, please. And so what happens in the field is that pretty much the only process that can change that, um, you know, signature, so for example, minus 29 um, of the carbon-13 ratio in PCE, the only thing that can change that number in the real world is um, de degradation or fractionation. Uh, from biodegradation. <clears throat> so that ratio is not affected by dilution, diffusion, or volatilization, and so it's an excellent indicator of biodegradation um, if that um, value uh, becomes what they call enriched. So if the number becomes less negative, it's an indicator that biodegradation is occurring. And the slide kind of explains what's happening. The bacteria find it easier to pull the lighter <clears throat> isotope out of the molecule as they're chewing it up. And so the, you know, the parent um, product, PCE, becomes enriched in the heavier uh, isotope. And so that ratio becomes less negative. And, um, you know, the CSIA is, is really pretty definitive in terms of um, establishing the presence of biodegradation. It's also pretty definitive in uh, differentiating various sources <clears throat> of the same, you know, chemical. <clears throat> it uh, should be noted that um, there are <clears throat> some remediation processes that actually can change the uh, isotope ratio just because of the kind of violent oxidation uh, nature of the process. And so, you know, if you're going to use ISCO in a source area and you're also using uh, you know, the isotope analysis, both on site and down gradient, to establish some uh, criteria. You really need to take baseline data before you uh, implement your, um, uh, your remedy. Next slide, please. So, here, here's a graph that um, kind of indicates the, this process. Um, so we're looking at the, the the section of the graph that's highlighted in the uh, the dash blue line. Got a red arrow pointing to it, and the idea here is that the source area is over on the left as well. MW12A, <clears throat> the um, scale, the x-axis is this um, uh, carbon isotope ratio, and it's getting enriched as it moves to the right. So next, less negative. And the various wells along the biodegradation enrichment line there, those are wells that are progressively further off-site. And so what's happening here is you can see that with distance, uh, not only is the, um, the concentration uh, being reduced, but the carbon isotope ratio is being enriched. And that's a, a clear sign of degradation occurring um, in the subsurface. Next slide, please. So I'm just briefly going to talk about the um, new section that was added to the guidance. And the idea here is that at many sites, especially older sites or sites with chlorinated solvents, um, you know, extensive remediation is done. Um, but what's happened is that <clears throat> contaminants have kind of diffused into lower permeability units at the site. And while all of the high permeability units have been cleaned through remediation, over time you get this very slow back diffusion of contaminants from these lower permeability units, um, you know, into the higher permeability units. I mean, that's just one example of how this process can occur. But basically, you know, you perform the remediation, there's significant decrease in concentrations. Uh, contaminants continue to decrease slowly over time, and then they kind of reach a, 
an asymptotic level. Um, and in many cases, that level is, you know, above the groundwater uh, quality standard. And as Alex mentioned, um, there was a, a policy um, probably about 10 years ago in an early version of the uh, RAO guidance that indicated that, well, you know, under these conditions, um, it's still acceptable to move to MA as long as, you know, certain conditions are met. Uh, next slide, please. And so these are the conditions that need to be met. I mean, they're kind of the same conditions that you would have to meet anyway for any kind of M&A um, approach. But, um, you know, you have to make sure that no receptors are threatened by uh, the contaminant concentrations that remain in the ground. Um, next slide, please. And I think one of the, um, you know, uh, good jobs that the committee did in looking at this older guidance was that, you know, early on, it really was pretty convoluted. Um, you know, it, it didn't, it really implied that it covered all chemicals and certain chemicals were capped at certain levels, et cetera. And the committee, we, you know, we looked at that and said, you know, it's way too complicated. I mean, if we're going to have a policy that allows for this kind of condition to occur, let's just agree that it applies to any chemical as long as it's within an order of magnitude 10 times the, uh, the, the quality standard, groundwater quality standard. And, you know, as long as those other factors are met in terms of protectiveness, you know, let's just go with this. So I think we did a good job of streamlining the policy and, and really applying it to, um, you know, a larger kind of population of situations. Next slide, please. And I, I think that's it. Very awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, and thank you for presenting, even though you're not feeling well. Um, I know one person commented that the, it was a little bit hard to understand you at times, um, but I appreciate you for being Sorry here. Um, all right, okay. so uh, we only have a couple questions so far, um, and these may be questions for Steve, Al, or Mike. I'm not sure who, so just be at the ready. The first question is, is there an upper end of concentration, for example, um, X times the groundwater quality standard, that DEP will accept for an MA groundwater wrap? I don't know who that question is for. Maybe um, Al? Um, sure, I can take it. Um, so I, I think it's very contaminant, like uh, specific contaminants are going to have different answers to that question. So what we're really looking for is just making sure that with your specific contaminants that you have at your site, that you do an evaluation of effective solubility to make sure that there isn't free or residual product that's still present at a site. So when we see higher levels of dissolved phase concentrations, we're really looking to see well, are those concentrations indicative of product or source remaining? So there isn't specific levels where the department is like, this isn't acceptable, but for specific contaminant concentrations, if you see a specific contaminant at a certain level, the department is going to question, well, is that contaminant concentration indicative of source material or free residual product remaining at a site? And we're going to expect that an LSRP gives us technical justification that the levels left proposed to be treated with M&A are not indicative of free residual product remaining. Great, all right, thank you for that, Al. Um, the next question I have is, um, if I meet the non-decreasing level for M&A, is the use of indefinite CEA allowed? Um, in general, we don't really want to see indeterminate CEA proposals for volatile organic compounds. If you have a site where you have a stable plume, you do your fate and transport analysis, and the CEA duration is coming back 
at something over, like something that in, indicates it's gonna be around for quite a long time, we generally recommend that you give us that fate and transport data, tell us what duration the fate and transport data gave you, and then use like a 30 year duration in lieu of an indeterminate CEA. So we have a trigger to go back and reevaluate the CEA duration over time. Great, okay. Um, we only have about four more minutes before we have to move on, so I see a couple more. Um, what is considered a reasonable time frame for MNA, which you may have just answered, Alba? Yeah, generally we're expecting less than 30 years. It's all based on the half-life of the contaminant at your site, so you should be calculating a site-specific half-life for your contaminant of, contaminants of concern, and then using fate and transport data, making sure that the CEA duration you calculate with that site-specific half-life is uh, within literature values. So if you get a, half, a site-specific half-life for benzene, let's say that's you know, 10 years, well, that's pretty far outside literature values, and there may be something else going on at your site. And you should at least be justifying in the RAR why you're getting such a high site-specific half-life, which would result in a longer CEA duration. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, the next one, uh, for non-decreasing levels of groundwater, does the CEA sampling and reporting continue indefinitely? Uh, can you re repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. For non-decreasing levels of groundwater, does the CEA sampling and reporting have to continue indefinitely? Uh, I mean, it'll, well, the, you're going to have like a stable trend and it's going to be a longer CEA duration than other sites. We don't expect it to be there indefinitely. So I wouldn't say there's indefinite sampling, but I will say, I think others will may touch on this like at the Q&A portions later in this uh, training, but with the... Uh, well, it's kind of like what you already said. Hey, what you already said, Alex, I mean, if you've got that situation, you're establishing a 30-year time frame, and then, you know, it's going to be evaluated then over time, at the very least, at those increments, right? Yeah, I think what they're getting at is if it's stable and you've sampled a lot, can I stop sampling at a certain point? And no, we're gonna expect there to be more data collected over time. And what I was gonna say, I kind of blanked for a minute, was the recommended sampling schedule in the MA guidance document that like tears down from annual to biennial to every four to eight years, depending on your specific contaminant at your site. Uh, we're gonna actually probably want look more frequent sampling for some of these sites because if there is a stable plume we it's kind of outside the normal MA boundaries so we want to make sure that we have additional uh, data over time to make sure that it remains stable and there doesn't eventually become an increasing trend at some point mm -hmm. okay great i'm going to read one more question because i think it's a good one um, and then we'll move on so can MNA be applied in the Pinelands where the applicable standards are the PQL and not the groundwater quality standards? Um, I don't see why not, but um, that it would be definitely be a site specific scenario and it would be something that would have to be talked about and justified in the RAR because really I think we had regular groundwater conditions like 2A in mind when we were coming up with that section of the guidance document, but um, I don't. We don't have a specific carve out that says you can't do it in the pinelands, but it would right. be a discussion. Okay, good answer. Okay, so it's 9:50. We're gonna have to move on. Oh, actually, I, I'm just kidding because we're ahead of schedule. Um, we actually have 10 more <laughs> minutes if we want to use them. So I'm gonna read a couple more questions. Um, is there a situation where DEP will accept less than eight quarterly groundwater monitoring events? For MNA, uh, yeah, I mean, it's going to be a deviation from the guidance document. So there's going to need to, that deviation should be talked about in your RAR. You should be providing technical justification and multiple lines of evidence to support 
that you don't need the eight rounds that are recommended, but in general, DEP is always going to recommend that eight rounds be collected after an aquifer e reaches equilibrium. Okay, um, next question. Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry, go ahead, Steve. If, yeah, an example would be, you know, you've got this, you know, kind of precipitous drop in your concentrations um, within, you know, a year, you've almost achieved groundwater quality standards, you know, after a year, well, you know, you may just exit the, uh, the need to even go for a permit, you know, or, you know, the concept, again, that's just an example, you know, you have such an effective response um, for monitored natural, natural attenuation that it's clear within, you know, four monitoring periods that you're well on the way to, you know, achieving your objective. Yeah, and I'll just add, that's definitely the case when you have an aquifer that's reached equilibrium. So if you have, let's say you do a remedial action that doesn't really impact the groundwater chemistry, like you're doing an excavation at a site, and then you take six rounds of data and everything, it almost gets the standard. It immediately goes from, you know, benzene in the thousands and thousands down to single digits within six rounds. Clearly you've removed the source we're not, we're not gonna question that. But if you get a site where you do injections and it's been four rounds and the contaminants drop drastically, we are going to expect you to go out and collect additional rounds to make sure that there's not rebound associated with that injection. So just make sure to take into account what type of remedial method you're using at your site. Great, okay, the next question, um... I don't know if this is a response to something else you said, because it's not really a full question, but what about a CEA for metals, which do not degrade? Oh yeah, so uh, I mentioned earlier with indeterminate CEAs, we don't want to see indeterminate CEAs for volatile organic compounds. So when you have metals, we regularly accept indeterminate CEAs for metals and sometimes for SVOCs, depending on what they are. Okay, glad you knew what that was referring to. Okay, mm -hmm. um, next question. Can you define can you define what is defined by groundwater aquifer reaching equilibrium prior to M and A starting? Uh, so, ideally, what we want to see is, let's say you do an injection, we want to see pre-injection conditions based on groundwater chemistry. But we, we do understand that sometimes when you change the groundwater chemistry, you can kind of permanently, or for lack of a better term, per permanently, you can do long lasting effects and create like a new e normal, I'd say a new equilibrium. So we just wanna make sure that you look at the groundwater chemistry after your rem remedial action and you get kind of, you get back to some sort of baseline, whether that's pre-injection conditions or a, a new baseline that's stable over time. Great. All yeah, right. I mean, I, I think the idea is that if you're adding, you know, chemicals whose purpose is to degrade um, contaminants, you want those specific chemicals really not to be evident or performing their function anymore, because what you're looking for is natural processes, not, you know, a process that you're an active you know, uh, reagent that you've added to the aquifer. So the idea is, you know, the active agents need to be depleted so that you're only looking at natural processes. Yeah, I guess like a more specific uh, example might be something like zero valent iron, where that can last a long time. So if you're doing eight rounds of sampling after an injection like that, you may not be able to get m and You may have to do an active permit because you have an injection that is long lasting that you may re-inject over time potentially. But uh, yeah. All right, great, okay. Um, we have, I guess, five more minutes technically according to the agenda. We do have a couple more questions. So um, what about indeterminate CEAs for VOCs where groundwater controls, for example, pump and treat are in place? Is that acceptable? That can be acceptable. A lot of active permits that my group does 
will have indeterminate durations. But yeah, I, I guess I should clarify that indeterminate duration CEAs for CEAs with volatile organic compounds, we don't like to see those for M&A cases. Okay. Um, okay, next question. Are there any policies surrounding the presence and persistence of TICs being the only driver for a groundwater wrap? Can okay, you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. Are there any policies surrounding the presence and persistence of TICs being the only driver for a groundwater wrap? There are not any specific policies on that that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, probably read maybe one more question. So other than PEC or PCE, excuse me, can CSIA be used for other compounds that have their own isotope composition? I think that one's for Steve. Yeah, um, sure. Any, you know, anything that has carbon in it or chloride, um, you know, it was used quite a while for uh, um, MTBE and TBA, same kind of thing. So yes, there's many applications for the isotopes. Great. Okay, um, I think we're gonna move on. Um, so thank you, Al and Steve, for answering all those questions for us. Um, and folks, as a reminder, if you have questions while someone is presenting, please don't wait. Type in your questions as soon as you have them. Um, it makes it easier for us when we're doing the question segments. So our next speaker is going to be Mike Gaudio again, Bureau Chief of uh, the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting. He's going to be talking about groundwater wrap applications, forms and processes, and common deficiencies that they see. Mike, if you're here, take it away. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, I'm going to go over the uh, groundwater wrap applications uh, and the forms, uh, as well as go over some of the common uh, deficiencies we see with the groundwater wrap applications, uh, including some tips on how to address them and, and where you can find that information uh, in the groundwater wrap guidance document. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a list of uh, the uh, groundwater wrap applications and, and uh, forms. Uh, so hopefully everybody's familiar with these as they've been out there for a while. Um, there were some minor updates to the uh, wrap applications and forms that'll uh, should be posted in the next day or two. Um, uh, as a result of updating the groundwater wrap guidance document, um, I'm going to go over some of the important updates uh, to the to the applications and forms uh, with the next couple of slides here. So, next slide, please. Okay, so if you read the uh, groundwater wrap uh, guidance document, uh, you'll you'll know that the department is considering any technical and practicability determinations to be an active system wrap given that M&A uh, is not appropriate for these types of situations and uh, containment of the contamination is required. Um, so you see here, the green arrow shows you that the, uh, the changes to the form, uh, you'll see section B uh, now indicates that you pay the active system groundwater wrap fee, which currently is the same as the M&A fee. Um, and you'll section B also, uh, section G also, uh, you'll see uh, it prompts the user to complete the active remediation question in that section. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide will show you uh, the change uh, the, on the uh, section J of the initial groundwater app application where uh, question number two uh, now includes the specific scenario when you have subslab soil gas contamination that remains above the uh, NJDP soil gas screening levels uh, beneath the building. Uh, as you can see, the first two check boxes need a, a VI long-term monitoring plan, where the uh, last check uh, box is when you have subslab soil gas contamination above the NJDP residential soil gas screening levels for a non-residential structure. And this simply needs a, a, a plan to evaluate uh, the change in use and make sure the use doesn't change where, uh, uh, you know, a VI uh, investigation should be completed. Um, so you could, that this could be accomplished through uh, annual, uh, you know, building inspection, inspections to make sure the use doesn't change. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, so this slide, uh, the next couple of slides, uh, we'll, we'll go over the uh, most common deficiencies for the groundwater wrap applications. Um, the number one deficiency is that groundwater contamination is not horizontally and vertically delineated. Um, it's important to note here that modeling of the contamination is not acceptable at the remedial action stage, uh, and that the groundwater contamination should be uh, delineated using clean zone sampling at the remedial action stage. Uh, in all directions. Um, hopefully this message is out there at this point as this policy statement was sent out in, in numerous listservs with slight revisions dating back to, to 2013. Um, this policy statement could be found on the uh, site remediation guidance document webpage under the uh, administrative guidance section. Okay, so the tips here, um, you know, make sure, you know, you discuss how delineation was completed in the RAR. Use Section K, other information of the uh, RAP application to, to document that. Um, indicate which clean points in all directions with receptors on it. You know, the, be clear about, you know, how, how you delineate it. Um, and provide a good map highlighting the clean sampling points in all directions uh, with the receptors on it. Um, remember knowing that the complete extent of the groundwater contamination in all directions is very important as it affects uh, the evaluation of receptors and determining uh, trigger distance as it relates to the VI pathway or potable and irrigation well sampling. Um, the appropriate, you'll see uh, at the bottom of the slide, the appropriate section of the groundwater rep guidance document uh, with these tips. Um, and, and all the slides will have this. Next slide, please. Okay, so another common deficiency um, is that the groundwater wrap application uh, doesn't have, you know, it, it lacks or no explanation for any of the variances from rules and deviation for guidance documents uh, wasn't provided. Um, and this includes, you know, um, you know, not, not providing uh, multiple lines of evidence to support professional judgment. Um, the tip here is, you know, simple. Make sure to provide as much explanation and discussion as necessary in the RIR. You can use Section K as well of the RAP application. Um, and the RIR should focus on the receptors and include multiple lines of evidence uh, as necessary to support the professional judgment um, and why the groundwater remedial action is protective of public health and safety in the environment. Um, remember, this I tell everybody this is the permit reviewer doesn't know the site history like you do. So the RAR should be like a book where anyone can pick it up and understand what happened at a site from start to finish. Um, and again, the appropriate. Um, section of the groundwater wrap guidance document with these tips is referenced on this slide. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, another common deficiency is that the receptor evaluation is not complete for, for a site. Um, this is the most important thing and one of the first things the permit reviewer is looking at as it relates to a wrap application. Um, and many times the door-to-door -door survey results are not provided or uh, the door-to-door -door survey is incomplete. Um, sometimes we see potable irrigation wells within the sampling tr trigger distances are in uh, sampled or the VI pathway uh, at a building is not investigated as, as required. Um, and, and you'll see the next couple slides, I'm going to show you this, but Remember that you know the VI trigger distances are applied from the edge of the groundwater contaminant plume based on linear interpolation of the groundwater data as defined by exceedances of the VI groundwater screening levels. Um, it's not appropriate to apply the, the VI sampling trigger distance based solely on the location of a monitor well itself uh, when determining which building should be investigated. Uh, so the tips here: make sure to uh, the RIR focuses on the evaluation of receptors, have a good section on that, um, and, and how trigger distances were determined. Uh, provide VI groundwater screening level ISO contour maps for the contaminants of concern based on interpolation using real data collected at the site. 
Um, remember, the further your delineation sampling points are from the source area, increases the uh, number of receptors that will need to be evaluated. And again, the appropriate section of the groundwater wrap guidance document with these tips is referenced at the bottom of this slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so this map here um, shows how interpolation is apply, applied uh, for the VI trigger distance. Uh, you'll see for vinyl chloride here, um, we have MW31, uh, MW1 with 30 ppb vinyl chloride, and you'll see it's delineated in all directions with non detect sampling results. Uh, based on interpolation, the, the uh, 15 ppb iso contour uh, would be approximately halfway between MW1 and the clean wells, and the uh, 1 ppb VI groundwater screening level, uh, as you can see, would be just before you reach the clean wells. Um, so the VI uh, sampling trigger distance would be 100 feet from the red 1 ppb iso contour for vinyl chloride, and you can see the uh, the red boxes on this figure indicating which building should be investigated for the uh, VI pathway. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, same, similar to the one um, just before, except for this one is for benzene. Um, as you can see, MW1 has 70 ppb benzene in it, and it's delineated in all directions again with non detect sampling results. Uh, based on interpolation, the 35 ppb iso contour would be halfway between one and the clean wells. Uh, and continue to use that concept, you see approximately where the 23 ppb VI ground at screening level for benzene would be. Uh, and then the VI sampling trigger distance would be 30 feet from the red 23 ppb uh, iso contour for benzene. And You'll see again the red boxes uh, of the buildings which uh, should be investigated for the VI pathway. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, another common uh, deficiency we see is with the CAWRA fact sheet form. Um, such as the uh, CA shape's not acceptable. Um, you'll see in our new CA section that it's recommended um, that the CA shape be drawn to the, to the clean sampling points in all directions, um, since the data is now available at the RA stage. Um, another common issue we see is that the cross-section figures are missing or, or we're missing contaminants to concern uh, on the fact sheet form, you know, make sure all contaminants concerned that uh, have exceedances of the groundwater remediation standards are, are on the fact sheet form. Another common issue we see is the GIS compatible map of the CA wasn't submitted to the department. Uh, the GIS information is an important part of the uh, institutional control for the site. Um, so that anyone can see you know, where the contamination is for a site and make sure no one is doing something that they shouldn't be doing, such as putting a potable well in the groundwater contamination. So it is an important part uh, of the, the groundwater wrap application process, as well as establishing the CA at the RA stage as well. Uh, the main tip here is uh, draw your CA shape to the clean zone at the remedial action stage, as it's based on the actual data collected and it's more protective of receptors. Uh, make sure the form includes all the contaminants concern above the groundwater remediation standards and, and include all of the required exhibits from the form. And make sure you email the uh, GIS compatible map to the department uh, just prior to submitting the uh, groundwater wrap application. And the, again, the appropriate section of the groundwater wrap guidance document with these tips is referenced below on the slide. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this slide shows you some common deficiencies with the groundwater monitoring plan. Um, you know, sometimes the groundwater monitoring plan is not even submitted, um, which is a problem in itself. Uh, but a lot of times we'll see that the monitoring plan is missing a sentinel well, or only two monitoring wells are included in the groundwater monitoring plan. Um, you know, we need to have at least three wells that account for triangulation in the groundwater monitoring plan. Uh, 
So groundwater flow can be determined and to show that the sentinel well location and the uh, remedial action is protective. Um, also, it's important to note here too that if you have variable groundwater flow at your site that you should um, have multiple sentinel wells um, for every direction of groundwater flow. Um, another issue we see is the uh, sampling frequency uh, is not adequate um, based on the proximity of receptors or the fate and transport modeling that's provided. Uh, so just keep receptors in mind when you're uh, coming up with your proposed sampling frequency. Uh, tips here, make sure, again, keep the receptors in mind when submitting the uh, groundwater monitor plans. Support the sampling frequency in, in your monitor well selection in the RIR. Uh, make sure the groundwater monitoring plan spreadsheet uh, matches up with what you're proposing in the text of the RER. Sometimes we see that those don't match. Um, and remember, all groundwater apps are required to have a, a sentinel well in it to be protective of receptors. And again, the bottom of the slide has the appropriate section of the groundwater guidance document with these tips in it. Next slide, please. Okay, another Common deficiency is uh, that the VI long-term monitoring plan is missing, where we have sub-slab soil gas contamination remaining beneath the building. Um, the long-term monitoring of this receptor is important uh, as building conditions can change, um, and we want to make sure all building occupants uh, remain protected. Um, the last bullet here you'll see is just a note that if sub-slab uh, soil gas contamination is greater than the residential soil gas screening levels for non-res non structure, then uh, it needs to be part of the RAP to ensure the uh, site use does not change uh, for that building. Uh, tip here is a simple one. Uh, don't forget to include your VI issues with your groundwater RAP application. Um, again, the appropriate section of the groundwater RAP guidance document is at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. Okay, we have our second of four test your knowledge questions here. Um, modeling the groundwater contamination plume boundary is acceptable during the A, RA stage, B, RI stage, or C, any stage. Give you about a minute for that. And again, just another reminder, three out of the four poll questions today have to be answered and you have must stay logged in the entire session this, up, this morning. Okay. Folks, just a reminder too, I put the SurveyMonkey link in our chat. Please fill out that SurveyMonkey at the end of our training today to let us know how we did or if you have any suggestions for uh, future trainings. We've given everybody enough time. The answer is B, the RI stage. Mike? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so this slide here um, shows you uh, the common deficiencies that we have with the uh, MA uh, groundwater wrap applications. Um, uh, this slide has a list of uh, why it's determined not to be appropriate. Uh, the department expects here um, that all contaminants are concerned and, and all modern wells uh, have a decreasing trend in them before applying for groundwater wrap. Um, if you don't have a decreasing trend, then, then you should be evaluating why. Maybe you have source material remaining. Maybe you have another AOC that needs additional investigation at the site. Um, as Steve just mentioned, and, and uh, Alex and Liliana will talk later on in the training, um, the m and guidance document does provide guidance about contaminants uh, concerned that have a stable trend where uh, 
uh, concentrations of less than 10 times the groundwater remediation standard. So there'll, there'll be more uh, to come on that topic uh, later. Um, another common issue we see is that uh, simply there's not enough groundwater uh, sampling events uh, conducted after the last active remedial action at the site. Um, as indicated in the uh, m and and, and groundwater wrap guidance documents, uh, it's recommended that eight rounds of groundwater sampling be conducted, four of those uh, which should be quarterly to evaluate for uh, seasonal fluctuation. Um, and we understand that this guidance and, and, and the, as the question was answered earlier, you know, there may be situations where less than eight rounds may be acceptable, such as, you know, all source material excavated and, and uh, only low level uh, contamination remains after, after the remedial action. Uh, but this is important where you recognize the deviation from the guidance and document the multiple lines of evidence to support it in your RAR. Um, and another common reason um, uh, for a deficiency with the M&A uh, wrap applications is there's evidence of free and residual product remain at the site, maybe you have a sheen on the water table or uh, elevated contaminant levels remaining. Um, so again, the tip here, make sure the RIR supports why m and is the appropriate groundwater remedial action and, and make sure you conduct any post remedial sampling to demonstrate that uh, product no longer exists and has been removed from the site. Uh, and remember, m and of free and, and or residual product is prohibited pursuant to 5.1e of the tech regs. Uh, the appropriate section of the groundwater wrap guidance segment uh, with these tips is referenced at the bottom of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier. This slide uh, shows uh, Appendix 1 of the groundwater wrap guidance document. Uh, it's the model table for historic groundwater sampling and results by monitoring well. Um, if you, you present your groundwater data in this in this format, it's it's uh, it's very useful for the user as well as the permit reviewer. I mean, you'll see there's a lot of good information on here. Um, you'll see we have the uh, you know overburden or bedrock under the, the the well, so we know what we're what type of aquifer we're dealing with. Uh, has a sampling method on there, depth to water. Also has a comment uh, field where you could provide, uh, you'll see like the first half for MW1 uh, is grayed out, you know, that could be pre-remedial uh, action as, and then the uh, whited out areas would be post. So it's, you know, it's, it clearly differentiates when the remedial action, uh, data before the remedial action and data after the active remedial action. Uh, and it's, you know, just, it's a very good, tool in addition to other, you know, graphs and all that to, to kind of get the eye test for, you know, the, the, the uh, trends with the uh, sampling results. So if you use this, we recommend you use this format, this type of table uh, in this fashion and, and uh, it'll, the permit reviewer will be very happy if, when data is presented in this uh, fashion. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so for active groundwater wrap applications, many times the uh, deficiency is simply that the uh, proposed remedial action uh, is not acceptable, uh, such as free product recovery in the form of socks, HIT or EFR events that do not address the uh, entire extent of the product body. Um, these, these remedial actions are considered more of a short-term remedy than a long-term remedy. Um, so the tip here, uh, make sure that the active groundwater meal action addresses the entire extent of the product body um, when it's as applicable. Um, also make sure that the, uh, the groundwater monitor plan includes uh, post remedial sampling in it. Uh, you, you know, you, you need to have a game plan for when the active remediation is complete. Um, you can contact BRAP with any questions, or you can always request a technical consultation with the Bureau of Groundwater Pollution Abatement, as well as BRAP. Um, and you'll see there's a link provided on this slide for your reference. And again, the uh, appropriate section of the Groundwater Wrap Guidance document with these tips is referenced on the bottom of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. 
And that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Well, moving right ahead, uh, I'd like to introduce Mike Infanger of the Bureau of Media Action Permitting, as well as Chad Smith, PBF Holding Company, and they'll be presenting on financial assurance. Mike and Chad? Uh, hi, I'm Mike Infanger. I'm a supervisor with the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting, and I act as the uh, financial assurance coordinator for the program. Uh, next slide. Okay, financial assurance is uh, mandated by the Site Remediation Reform Act. It established a permitting program to regulate the operation, maintenance, and inspection of engineering and institutional controls. Uh, NJSA. 58 colon 10 C-19 establishes financial assurance. If you see NJSA 58 colon 10 B-3, that's Brownfields. If you see that document it is not financial assurance, that is a remediation funding source. Uh, next slide. Uh, some entities are exempt from uh, establishing financial assurance. Uh, one exemption is a government entity, and that, of course, includes the municipalities and counties and such, but also includes um, quasi-governmental uh, agencies like the Turnpike and the uh, Parkway, and also includes um, public universities. Um, we have what's known in our parlance as a, an innocent purchaser exemption. That's uh, someone who did not, was not involved in the discharge, you know, was not the owner or operator at the time of the discharge, and who purchased the property before May of 2009. And uh, child cares and uh, schools are exempt, as well as residences. And the uh, owner or operator of a small business who's performing a remediation at their property, okay, and um, note you have to own or operate at the site in order um, in order to have the exemption. And um, all parties on the permit must have an exemption for the uh, for the permit to be exempt from FA. If one party does not have an exemption, then they have the responsibility of posting the financial assurance. Next slide, please. Um, Residential condominiums are a, a special case. Um, if the permittee is a residential condominium, then uh, an FA mechanism is not re required to be secured if documentation of the annual association budget uh, is submitted and reflects the amount dedicated to uh, operation, maintenance, and inspection of the engineering controls. And if if this is chosen as the financial assurance mechanism, um, I shouldn't say mechanism, um, as the way of satisfying financial assurance, please submit your budget and um, indicate the line items that uh, contain the permit costs. Um, generally, the, the budget isn't going to say permit fees or, or something. It's going to say something like administrative or engineering. You know, please indicate which lines and the amount of that line is uh, dedicated to um, the um, permit costs. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, for the uh, permit application. Um, when you um, submit an application, when an engineering control is implemented, uh, submit the remediation cost review and RFS uh, slash FA form. Uh, especially important on, uh, especially important for financial assurance is section J or section K, uh, which is the entity posting the financial assurance. It's section J if the entity is the uh, person responsible for conducting the remediation, and the section K if it's um, anyone else. Um, also attached should be a cost estimate, um, and, um, and um, also the original financial assurance mechanism. Um, 
Okay, for that, uh, any bank document or um, or surety bond uh, needs to be the original document. Uh, for a uh, remediation trust fund is is uh, permissible for the trustee to keep um, the original and send a copy to the department. Uh, although that policy may change. Uh, please note uh, that there's no 1% surcharge on the financial assurance. The 1% surcharge pertains to a remediation funding source. Okay, and you might be accustomed to, you know, cutting the check for 1% uh, of the amount. But that's um, that's not uh, required on financial assurance. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the types of mechanisms for financial assurance include the remediation trust fund, uh, and that is um, cash held in uh, escrow, um, and that's usually the, um, the trustee is usually an attorney or uh, a bank officer. Um, also a line of credit, which is um, an open line of cash available, you know, usually using the property as the collateral. Uh, a letter of credit is a promise of cash to a beneficiary, and the beneficiary would be the department. Uh, an environmental insurance policy, and that's claims-based uh, claims of available funds to the department, and a, um, a surety bond. A surety bond is um, permitted in the uh, readoption of SARA, and we are allowing the use of surety bonds uh, prior to the uh, rules being changed, prior to the um, to the ARCS readoption. Um, uh, you might have a lot of inquiries about uh, surety bonds since they generally cost less and they don't count against your credit rating. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, where do you find these wonderful docu model documents? Uh, on the forms webpage. We have put them right under the remedial action permit forms. In fact, they're the first item. Um, first item is financial assurance and you see uh, all the, the model documents. We've had a lot of trouble with people using the remediation funding source documents because they look pretty similar, but um, but the differences are the the statute, as I mentioned at the beginning, you want to the you want to reference the uh, SARA or the um, rather than Brownfields, and of course the address. The address would be to um, uh, remedial action permitting, not the uh, remediation funding source group. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, for environmental insurance policies, there is no model document. Um, they're evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, they must uh, comply with 5.5 uh, in the ARCS role. And the, um, the DEP must be the insured or be listed as being able to make a claim. Um, either, course, when we evaluate these policies, we'll be looking um, for exclusions or deductibles, and of course there there can't be any of those. Now they might, um, um, an R, RP might tell you, oh, I have an environmental insurance policy. But in, most likely they're the, the beneficiary of that policies. Uh, old policies will usually need to be changed or riders added to, uh, to allow the department to make a claim. Uh, next slide, please. And um, for the amount of the financial assurance, okay, we uh, to be included are the cost of maintaining uh, the engineering include the engineering control, including uh, the maintenance, upkeep, inspections, materials, and monitoring. Uh, but also the administrative costs, uh, the biennial reporting and the permit fees. And the value of the amount is the is calculated over the duration of the engineering control. Um, for a permanent engineering control like a cap, uh, we assume it's uh, in, um, 30 years. Um, for an active remediation is represented by the amount of time the system will be in operation. 
And um, um, we have um, Chad Smith, uh, who is a stakeholder um, for our uh, guidance, and who will come, uh, who will give us uh, an exam some examples of calculating financial assurance amounts. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Chad Smith. I'm with PBF Energy. Uh, I work in our corporate HSC group. Uh, today, I'll be discussing some things to consider while calculating the financial assurance amount for your site. Uh, now, as Mike has mentioned, uh, the FAA needs to cover the full cost of the engineering control uh, for as long as it's needed. Uh, and as you know, I have the, uh, um, sorry, next, next slide, please. There we go. Uh, here I've included the definition of the engineering control, uh, which are obviously are needed uh, to contain contamination or to keep the remedy effective. Now for a groundwater wrap, uh, I've listed some potential examples where FA might be required. Obviously, uh, for many people, the first thing that comes to uh, your mind might be a groundwater pump and treat system. Uh, it's obviously an active remedy that's potentially uh, keeping contamination from migrating off site. Uh, another example could be uh, if you need to uh, do in situ injections to maintain a, some kind of barrier wall. Um, other examples, maybe on a smaller scale, would be a, a sub slab depressurization system or a point of entry system in a house. Um, those may be required, uh, unless, as Mike has discussed, those are exempt from financial assurance. Uh, next slide, please. So as you complete remedial action and head into the RA permit phase, the client and the LSRP and the consulting firm should have a pretty good understanding uh, of what the life cycle scope of the entire remedial action will be, and that will include uh, the cost for any engineering controls. Uh, basically, this should be essential project management, so you likely at this point have a good uh, estimate of, a cost, uh, of what the cost will be for the engineering control. Um, so, as you calculate the financial assurance amount, um, as you may know on the cost, remediation cost review and RFSFA form, uh, in section E it lists various methods for calculating the FA amount. That can include relying on bids from vendors or your company data or actual costs uh, over the last few years uh, in order to do the remediation. Uh, also for more complicated sites, you may uh, be interested in commercially available software such as Racer or Cost Pro. Those might be appropriate for your site. Those programs uh, take your inputs based on what kind of project you have, how many wells, et cetera, and they actually estimate cost based on unit rates um, that are actually updated on an annual basis. So again, for larger sites, that might be appropriate and something for you to consider. Either way, uh, the cost will need to be reviewed and certified by your LSRP. Um, as pointed out by Mike and other DEP guidance, there are certain things you definitely want to make sure that are not overlooked. Uh, and I've listed a few things here, such as uh, your biannual reporting costs, your annual permit fees, uh, any utilities to maintain uh, your system or uh, waste disposal costs. Um, and then once remediation is complete, if you're able to get to that point, any cost to decommission your system and return the site to uh, the appropriate or necessary conditions. Uh, one helpful item is listed on the RFS guidance page, which is the checklist that they provide. And that includes a section on the operation, maintenance, and inspection of engineering controls. So it provides a quick check. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, I've included a link to where that checklist is. It's on the remediation funding source page. And there on the right-hand side, uh, it shows uh, the checklist for engineering controls for both soil and groundwater. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd quickly present two examples of uh, how you might calculate an FA amount. The first is uh, for an active groundwater permit. Uh, in this scenario, it's a groundwater pump and treat system that's expected to operate into perpetuity. And as Mike has mentioned, per DEP guidance, you'll need to include the cost projected out over 30 years. So on the left-hand column, uh, I list first, uh, you know, the cost to maintain your, your groundwater pump and treat system, right? Your, the cost to maintain the wells, the piping, and do O&M, uh, and as well as the treatment system. Uh, also, uh, you want to include utilities, such as electricity or natural gas or, or what have you, and any waste disposal costs that you know of. Um, you also need to do performance monitoring for the system, 
groundwater sampling and analysis, data evaluation, et cetera, and what I've called administrative requirements uh, in my world, which is project management and LSRP oversight, uh, your biannual DEP report fees, uh, and your uh, annual fees as well. So I will note that these costs are totally fictitious and, and made up for this example. Uh, the only thing that's real is the wrap fee um, from the DEP, the current cost for that. Um, so you can see here, I have a yearly cost, and then you multiply that times 30 to get your financial assurance amount uh, total. Now, before your client has a panic attack that their remediation system is gonna cost six and a half million dollars over 30 years, you can use the net present value to discount the amount uh, for the interest rate over time. Mike's gonna talk about that here coming up shortly, but just as an, as an example, if you use a, a very conservative 1% nowadays, um, that would reduce that amount to about 4.8 million. So certainly something that you'll wanna consider um, you know, for your site. So, Next slide, please. So in the second example, uh, perhaps it's a small site with a groundwater natural attenuation permit. Perhaps it's a gas station with a, where the source has been removed, maybe it was a leaking storage tank, uh, but you have a small groundwater plume that's maybe migrated off site and requires a VI investigation on a residence. So as part of the remedy, you need to operate a slub slab depressurization system in that residence until the plume is gone, and that's been estimated to take about 12 years. So in this case, uh, the MNA sampling is not required to be included in the FA amount, but the vapor mitigation system is since that's an engineering control. So I've listed here costs to operate and maintain uh, the vapor mitigation system to do monitoring and, and utility costs, obviously, to, make, to keep that running, um, and then project management, LSRP oversight, you're still gonna have your biannual uh, DEP reports uh, and your annual wrap fees. Um, so those costs would be calculated out 12 years um, in this example, based on the current understanding. Uh, I've also included here the one-time cost to close out the project, um, if you're successful and able to do that. So you have VI termination sampling, and then the cost to decommission uh, the system and terminate your fee. So. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike. He's going to continue discussing uh, the net present value discount and FA requirements. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chad. Um, now, the um, net present value calculations um, that, that Chad was referring to, um, the, um, the amount that you post for S FA may follow the, the, uh, the formula that the amount posted is the FA value calculated divided by the discount rate, um, you know, raised to the number of years that um, that the system is um, pro projected to last. Uh, now, the discount rate is the actual interest rate. Um, for example, you might have a remediation trust fund, and the money's in an account, and you know what the interest rate is. Well, okay, that's easy. Just use uh, use that, or use um, in other cases you would use a published uh, value. Um, the department uses the federal OMB circular uh, A nine A ninety four appendix C. If you uh, look up the discount rate there, you'll see it's a two point six percent. So in uh, Chad's example, um, the amount would be the to be posted is the, um, the well, the calculated amount, 129,065 divided by um, the interest rate, 1.026, and um, that was over 12 years, so to the 12th power. If you do the calculations, you'll find that's uh, 94,850. So that's the amount you would uh, post using the present value calculations. Uh, next slide. Now, uh, sometimes financial instruments have to be changed. Um, it could be that um, the, there's a mistake in the uh, instrument, so you maybe use the wrong model, uh, or maybe you're increasing or decreasing the amount. Um, for remediation trust funds, uh, amendments are allowed according to section 16 of the agreement. 
but this involves ma making the change, initial, getting everybody to initial it, sending it to the department, getting us to initial it, and sending it back. So really, it's just as easy to submit a new agreement, and we'll just send the old one back. For a line of credit, um, a new document um, will usually be uh, required. You know, banks are kind of persnickety on this. Um, and uh, for a surety bond or environmental insurance policy, check with the provider because the policies vary widely through the industry. Uh, next slide, please. Now, letters of credit deserve their own slide because they're the most common form of financial assurance. If you go to the model document, you'll see it says irrevocable stand standby letter of credit. And for our purposes, that means that almost any change requires an amendment. Um, generally, the bank will want us to sign if it's um, a substantial or detrimental amendment. And almost anything you want to change is, they'll consider it that. So almost all amendments will require DEP approval. So um, uh, please ask the bank to put the PI number on the amendment. Um, I've been talked to banks and they say these are push button documents. Uh, so no information from the original letter goes on the amendment. Um, and when we get it, we say, well, what's, what's this for, you know? Uh, so it's, um, it's very helpful if the bank can add the PI number on to the amendment. And sometimes they won't want to listen to you. They'll want to listen to uh, the person establishing the amount. They'll say, we want to talk to the customer. So you might have to convey that uh, message to, um, to your uh, responsible party. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, if you have uh, site-specific questions um, on financial assurance, the, uh, the best thing to do is to contact me directly. And the best way is um, using my email uh, at the email address. Same format as uh, most of the department. And uh, uh, next slide, please. And um, yeah, we'll be entertaining uh, questions if you have general questions about uh, financial assurance. Awesome. Thank you, Mike and Chad, for that. We're actually going to be doing questions um, not only for the, uh, the FA section, but also for Mike Gaudio's section earlier. So the questions are um, probably going to start with. Uh, questions for Mike Gaudio. Um, the first question, can mitigation of the VI pathway be put into a soil wrap instead of a ground groundwater wrap? This scenario sometimes arises when a seller and a buyer of a site make an agreement that the buyer takes responsibility for the soil and the VI. Uh, yes, um, we, we do have the uh, VI uh, section is on our soil uh, wrap applications for, for that type of situation where the VI issue is related to the soil contamination and not the groundwater contamination. Um, so yes, we, we can incorporate uh, VI issues in with the, uh, with the soil permit. Great, okay. Um, where should vertical delineation samples be collected? The source, the plume edge, or where? I mean, we recommend that the vertical delineation be completed at just down gradient of the source area as close as possible. Um, and, and depending on, on your contaminants concern, you may need to go um, at the plume edge as well. Um, it all depends on, on what your data is showing, but you definitely need to do it at just down gradient of your uh, source area. Awesome, okay, next question. Um, regarding clean sampling required, is a temporary well, po well point adequate or is a permanent monitoring well required? Specifically thinking in cases of access issues. I'm sorry, repeat that question one more time. Sure, regarding the clean sampling that's required, is a temporary well point adequate or do you need a permanent, well mon permanent monitoring well? Um, 
Permanent, I mean, you need permanent, permanent monowells when, when you're talking about down gradient direction um, as a sentinel well location, because you're, you're going to need to do regular sampling of that. But yeah, if it's like an up gradient, uh, side gradient issue, um, your yeah, temporary well points could be uh, acceptable. Okay. Um, next question is, can passive diffusion samplers collected at different depths within wells be used for vertical delineation? Um, we, we do accept um, if you have enough screen where you could, you know, get samples for every five feet of screen. Uh, we, we will accept uh, uh, vertical screening of, of a, a modern well um, if, if it's possible. Um, Okay. Um, next question. Is the need for clean zone sampling delineation absolute? The rule includes a provision for variance. If it can be demonstrated that the remediation is protective without clean zone sampling delineation and a variance is documented, can a permit still be issued? Uh, yeah. I mean, there are cases, you know, where, where delineation can't be completed in a certain direction. You know, maybe you have the Garden State Parkway, right? Uh, you know, right next to your site or something like that, where, you know, you're just not going to be able to get a, a good modern well in, um, you know, to delineate. Um, you know, for those type of situations where, you know, it's, you could document uh, why it's not necessary to, to delineate in that direction, um, you know, get the multiple lines of evidence, support it. Um, but just keep in mind, you know, your, the receptors, you know, obviously if it's a, Potable drinking area, or you know, you have uh, potential VI concerns. We are going to expect that the, uh, if possible, that the, uh, the delineation be completed um, in that direction. Okay, makes sense. Um, next question: What do you mean? Sometimes the door-to-door -door survey is incomplete. So, the, and I'm sure this message is out there. I mean, the department expects that a uh, 100% uh, response rate. Uh, you know, be completed when, when doing the door-to-door -door survey. So, uh, you know, if you're out there mailing surveys um, to, to residents in the area, I mean, we expect that, you know, no response is, is not a, you know, hey, no response received is not enough. You need to follow up um, and, and, you know, make sure you, you go to the, to those properties where, where nobody's responding, uh, you know, during, you know, off business hours where, where you're likely to, you know, uh, get somebody that's home. Um, uh, you know, we expect that, you know, that the receptors be properly evaluated. We, we want to make sure that there aren't, you know, no potable wells um, around the site, you know, where, where we know we have contamination. We want to make sure nobody's drinking the contaminated groundwater. Uh, we understand this is, uh, you know, it could be tough to get the 100% response rate, but, you know, we, we that's what we expect, and if, if uh, it can't be done, then we, you know, multiple lines of evidence, uh, professional judgment should be provided, uh, you know, for those situations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next question, the rule and guidance state that the trigger distances apply out from the building boundary to the plume, not the other way around. Can you comment on that? Say that one more time. Sure. The rule and guidance state that the trigger distances apply out from the building boundary to the plume and not the other way around. I'm not sure what, what that's referencing. Okay. You can get a little more clarity on, on where that uh, information is being found. Okay. So, um, Jeffrey, who asked that question, we'll just have to get back to you on that one. Um, next question, if a former CEA did not go completely to the clean points, will the CEA need to be modified? If your permit was approved with uh, a certain CEA boundary, no, we're not going to say you need to, to modify it, but, you know, as part of your biaser or, you know, part of your reviewing your results, I mean, or if you're modifying your permit, uh, you know, for an administrative issue or something, and you know, maybe that's the time when you you update it. But no, we're not going to say just because you have a 
uh, a CA that's not drawn into the clean zone, uh, we're not going to make it modify it unless we deem it uh, uh, necessary for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, next question. <clears throat> Does the CEA shape need to be resubmitted for CEA extensions when there's no change from the existing shape? Yeah, if the, if the CA shape that's currently mapped is um, is still okay, then yeah, you don't need to resubmit it. We'll, we'll just update it. Um, we'll update the, uh, the CA subject item with the uh, wrap. Great. Um, are there any plans to revise the groundwater monitoring plan spreadsheet to include MNA sample frequency changes? Yeah, that's uh, actually next on our on our uh, RAP stakeholder list. So that is something that we're going to be um, visiting. Uh, so that we anticipate probably having changes to that uh, in the next couple of months. So uh, that that is next on uh, the uh, stakeholder committee um, agenda. Okay, great. Um, we only have until 10.55 for questions, so Mike, I'm probably going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to skip ahead and get some from Mike and Finger and Chad. Um, so last question for you, and the other questions will be answered via email after the training, so don't worry if yours wasn't answered. Um, does a sentinel well need to exhibit clean concentrations from installation to report submittal, or can a sentinel well have intermittent concentrations over time but demonstrate compliance for eight quarterly rounds prior to the report submittal? Yeah, we prefer to always have a center well that's clean, but we understand that, you know, if, if the plume is shrinking and, and, and we're confident that the contamination hasn't migrated past the center well, then you, you can um, use a, a plume fringe well, provided you have enough data to show that it's, you know, consistently been clean for yeah, a couple, you know, the eight rounds. Um, and, and demonstrate that there, the plume didn't migrate past that, or if you have data that, you know, shows that best case scenario, you have a central already past that, and then you're just kind of moving your central well to now a plume fringe well that's cleaned up and, and uh, hasn't shown uh, contamination for a while, then yeah, we, we, we could accept that. Great. Okay, so my next question is going to be for Mike Infanger. Um, so your first slide, Mike, said financial assurance is needed for an institutional control, but I thought financial assurance was not required for institutional controls. Can you comment? Okay, I'd have to look at that slide again because I think it says institutional and engineering controls, so it's an inclusive and. No, it, um, financial assurance is not required if you only have an institutional control. There has to be, uh, you know, essentially a cap or an active system or something. All right. Thanks for clarifying that, um, Mike. It did say and, so it, yeah. but that was helpful. Um, next question for you, Mike. And I think we have like one minute left for financial assurance. Does the permit fee, do the permit fees need to be included annually for the duration of the permit? For example, 30 years of permit fees for a cap? Yes, you would include 30 years of uh, permit fees for a, a permanent um, uh, engineering control, like a cap, or, okay. or, or an indeterminate um, groundwater system. Awesome. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll do our break. So when a wrap is transferred, is the new permittee required to post the financial assurance, and can the existing financial assurance be terminated? Uh, yes, the um, um, permittee, the, um, um, when, a per when the permit is transferred, the uh, new owner must either uh, uh, post the um financial assurance or have an exemption um or it, it could be that um the it is agreed upon that the present financial assurance remains in place we don't actually care who um posts the financial assurance and the um the regulations actually say you're allowed to post it on behalf of somebody else great um, I was thinking of something else. Um, 
Yeah, sorry. No more to add? Okay, that's great. Um, so it is 10.55. Um, we will start our break, which will be 10 minutes. So please come back by 11.05. Um, I recommend not logging out of your GoToWebinar because we are at full capacity, so you may not be able to get back in. So just, you know, leave it on your screen. We'll see you back at 11.05. Okay, guys, so the time is now 11.05. Um, we're gonna move into our next portion of the presentation. Um, we have Liliana Chikin of Enviro, Enviro Tactics, along with Al Shakanazef of the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting. And they'll be presenting on non-decreasing levels of groundwater contamination, along with a case study. Hey everybody, I'm back. Uh, I'm going to get us started off with this section, and then Liliana is going to come in about halfway through with a case study that we have. So, as I had answered some questions about earlier, and as Steve mentioned in his section of the training, the guidance document committee came up with a new section of the guidance document, uh, non-decreasing levels of groundwater contamination. So sometimes when you have both soil and groundwater, or when both soil and groundwater remediation were conducted at the site, groundwater contaminant concentrations reach asymptotic levels above an applicable remediation standard, but without decreasing contaminant concentration trends. M&A may still represent an appropriate remedy when groundwater, when groundwater contamination is present at low concentrations that exceed applicable remediation standards, but poses no risk to human health and the environment. Next slide, please. Uh, so some examples or some causes of situations at a site where these situations are caused. Uh, you could have back diffusion of contaminants from a low, a lower permeability lens at a site. You know, you have a clay underlaying a sandy layer at a site, and uh, you just have slowly those higher contam dissolved phase contaminant concentrations slowly reaching out, causing the stable concentration. Uh, you could have a perched aquifer with limited groundwater flow, or you could have a capped site with low infiltration. So those are only some of the uh, examples, but you get the idea. Uh, next slide, please. So with this situation, you can get to a point where remedial efforts have produced their maximum practical benefit in terms of lowering the concentrations of contaminants, and it can serve as justification for termination of, let's say, like an active remedial action that really isn't doing much at a site anymore. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So the new section of guidance document we came up with, it has six um, requirements or criteria that we really want investigators to look at when they're considering using an M&A wrap for a stable plume. With uh, So the, the first thing is we want to make sure that no receptors are impacted or threatened, you know, potable wells, wellhead protection areas, surface water, vapor, ecological. Uh, just make sure that all of your receptors have been addressed and uh, there's not going to be any receptors that are impacted. Uh, next slide, please. The second of our criteria is that all sources of groundwater contamination have been identified and remediated, you know, so free and residual products, smear zones, make sure the migration of the groundwater pathway has been addressed. Typically wanna make sure that there isn't sheen. Um, next slide, please. So you wanna make sure that the site is a candidate for monitored natural attenuation as described in earlier sections of the guidance document prior to getting to this section. So you wanna make sure delineation is complete, you have an appropriate number and placement of wells and sentinel wells at your site. Again, no free or residual product. Any sources of groundwater contamination have been addressed and that you've collected enough data to support M&A. So typically your eight rounds with four quarterly is what's recommended. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the fourth of our criteria is that ground 
the groundwater data set is representative of and not influenced by the ground groundwater elevation fluctuations. So the most common groundwater elevation fluctuations you're gonna see is seasonal. You just wanna make sure that you don't have a stable plume because of some seasonal aspect with like either groundwater, when the groundwater table goes up, you're hitting some sort of smear zone or something, or if the groundwater table goes down, you have a little bit of trapped product potentially that comes out and uh, is more available in the dissolved phase after a low water table. So those aren't really reasons we want to see a stable plume. We want to make sure that those potential sources have been addressed. Uh, so that's why we want you to look at seasonal fluctuations. Uh, some other groundwater elevation fluctuation types that you should also consider that were tidal and water use changes in the area such as industrial wells, pumping wells, etc. Uh, next slide please. The uh, fifth of our six criteria is that the person responsible for conducting the remediation has collected a minimum of eight rounds of sampling, which would include four quarterly sampling events, and that you've made an attempt to show a decrease in contaminant concentration trend. Uh, next slide, please. And the six of our criteria is that the asymptotic groundwater contaminant levels are within an order of magnitude of the respective groundwater quality, normally the groundwater quality standard, but sometimes the, the interim groundwater quality criteria as well. So uh, yeah, just to make sure that you look at all your contaminants and that they're within an order of magnitude of the standard, because if you're proposing a stable plume and you have contaminant concentrations above an order of magnitude from the groundwater quality standard, you're going to need to document a deviation from the guidance document. Uh, next slide, please. So then the new section of guidance gets into a couple of situations where you may meet those six criteria above, but it may still not be the best idea to use this section of guidance. Uh, so the first one is when you have contaminant concentrations that are in the part per million range for volatile organics and an evaluation of effective solubility demonstrates that product may remain. So the example that we give is that sometimes you can have ethyl benzene and toluene towards the higher end of their order of magnitude evaluation. You know, you have ethyl benzene at 6,000, toluene at six seven, eight thousand, and uh, well, I guess uh, five thousand, sorry. And uh, for certain sites you can do an, an evaluation of effective solubility which may show that even though those contaminant concentrations are within an order of magnitude of the standard, it could be uh, indicative of product remaining at the site. So just make sure to take a look at that when you have a multiple part per million range contaminant concentrations. Uh, next slide, please. And another situation uh, we wanted to bring up was dealing with contaminants expected to degrade quickly, which have a short half-life, but continue to be present at the multiple at multiple part per million concentrations. So again, the example we give is uh, some of the BTEX compounds other than benzene. When you get those in the multiple part per million range, the department starts wondering why those are sticking around so long at such a high concentration when typically the half-life for those types of contaminants is short. So we wouldn't expect to see a long-term stable plume for those contaminants generally. Um, next slide, please. All right, Al, I'm gonna interrupt for our third test your knowledge question. Um, m and while contaminant levels are non-decreasing, can be appropriate if A, a minimum of eight rounds of groundwater data has been collected, B, contaminants are delineated, C, all sources of contamination have been identified and remediated, or D, all of the above. We'll have a minute to answer this question. As a reminder, you have to answer three out of four poll questions today to be eligible for CECs. You also have to remain um, in the training from start to finish. Um, so please answer the question, don't log out. And yeah, um, as a reminder, um, 
we ask that you fill out our survey after the training is over to let us know your thoughts and if you have any thoughts for future trainings. We do have some trainings tentatively on the horizon, um, one of which is the Field Sampling Procedures Manual, chapters five through nine. That training will probably take place in July or August, but date to be determined. So just keep your eyes peeled for that announcement um, in the coming months. We have a couple more seconds. I see 89% of people voted or answered the question. So get your answers in. All right, that's our third poll question completed. And the answer to the question is C, all of the above. So I'll hand it back over to you, Al. Sure, and uh, I'm actually going to hand the presentation over to Liliana Secan, uh, who is going to go over a case study for a site where using this new section of guidance document would be appropriate. Okay, so uh, my name is Liliana Cecan and I'm a senior project manager at Tactics, and I have more than 30 years of environmental experience specializing in risk-based remediation based on soil, groundwater, and vapor intrusion modeling. And uh, for this uh, m and presentation, I uh, picked a case study, uh, which is a dry cleaner, um, a classical dry cleaner, uh, at which obviously contamination uh, is uh, tetrachloroethene and trichloroethene. Uh, for this site, uh, we remediated soils to address the ingestion dermal and inhalation pathways via excavation and uh, the migration to groundwater pathway via in situ treatment utilizing hydrogen release compound, uh, which is a simple, passive, low cost, and uh, long-term treatment option for in situ anaerobic bioremediation of chlorinated hydrocarbons. In the next slide, um, I have prepared a map in which uh, we show how many points. We had 42 uh, injection points on a 12 by 15 feet grid at depths ranging to 15 feet below ground surface. And the in situ treatment um, utilized approximately 32 pounds of uh, hydrogen release compound, advanced material mixed with approximately 120 gallons of water at each of the 42 injection locations. So, um, as you can see, it's a large area in which uh, this compound was injected, and we were hoping to achieve complete remediation, to have uh, groundwater measured in these monitoring wells, which you uh, see on the map uh, as uh, black and yellow dots. Uh, so MW2, uh, MW9, uh, clean. Um, the next slide presents the data. Um, so, as you can see, monitoring well two and monitoring well nine uh, had historically concentrations of uh, as high as 600 uh, microgram per liter, 700 microgram per liter. And after the soil was remediated in 2002, the levels were actually reduced by half. But then the uh, contamination, uh, PCNTC contamination, was uh, still fluctuating in the hundreds levels. So therefore, we decided in 2013 to perform this injection to address actually uh, migration to groundwater pathway, which at the time of 2002 was not a concern. So in the next slide, uh, you could see that we uh, first check after we applied this uh, injection, we first check to see if the PCE uh, and in the next slide tetrachloroethene uh, have variations 
similar to the groundwater elevation. And we realize that there is uh, not such a variation. So as uh, Al was mentioning before, if we would have such a variation, uh, back diffusion of contaminants from low permeability lenses or formation into more permeable, permeable deposits may have been existed. Uh, but we didn't uh, have this variation, so um, at the time we performed uh, groundwater modeling and applied for a groundwater uh, classification exception area. So if uh, you move to the next slide, you see the uh, PC and TC concentration trends uh, for monitoring well 2 and for monitoring well 9. Please move to the next slide. Uh, and they show, uh, so for monitoring well 2, for example, uh, the graph show no trend and also uh, it is, we use pro-UCL to do this statistical analysis and pro-UCL uh, conclusion was that we had insufficient statistical evidence of a significant trend at the specified level of signif significance. So then from a statistical point of view, we didn't have a decreasing trend. So um, the next slide is for MW9, and as you can see, PC shows kind of a decreasing concentration, and TC an increasing concentration, which may suggest that we have biodegradation, but still the pro-UCL uh, would mention that we have in statistical insufficient statistical evidence of a significant trend at the specialized level of significance. So with this information, we applied for a classification exception area. In the next slide, please, if you would like to move. Uh, so we applied for a classification exception area, but the problem was that we do not have a decreasing trend, so we could not say that actually we, um, we could apply for a CEA with MNA, and therefore we applied for a CEA without selecting a remediation. Um, so the final uh, remedial action was not yet selected. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the form, so that was what we clicked in the um, New Jersey DEP4. And we apply for a CEA and we got to have this classification exception area in the New Jersey uh, Geo web system. Uh, but we couldn't apply for a remedial action permit at the time. So now with a new guidance, we would be able to apply for a, a remedial action, groundwater remedial action permit. Um, so if you move to the next slide, please. Um, we have, uh, because we have checked the surface water, so we have this sentinel well, which is situated in between the groundwater contamination uh, transport flow, um, and the sentinel well is clean, and the surface water is farther away, so our contamination will not reach uh, surface water. The next slide shows that we conducted a receptor, uh, a vapor intrusion, a receptor evaluation in which a vapor intrusion uh, was prepared. Uh, so we have, uh, we conducted this vapor intrusion um, using the most recent version of the vapor intrusion guidance. And as Mike uh, said in the previous um, presentation, you should be careful that you should have this trigger distance from the age of the groundwater contaminant plume based on the linear interpolation of the groundwater data as defined by exceeding the vapor intrusion groundwater screening levels. So from the groundwater screening levels, not from the groundwater quality standards for vapor intrusion. So this is a reason this figure, in this figure, you could see that there are uh, two 
uh, ISO concentrations. One was for the CEA and the other one, the vapor intrusion uh, groundwater screening level ISO plan. We collected indoor air samples uh, and the indoor air samples um, after. Uh, sorry, first we collected collected subslab. Uh, the order is different here. So in subslab, or maybe it's not mentioned, subslab soil gas samples collected indoor air, and because we had exceedances of the indoor air standards, we installed subslab depressurization system systems as required in the building um, nearby. This this dry cleaner was in a mall, and uh, there were other uh, offices in that mall, other um, uh, stores in which we had to install this uh, subslab depressurization system. Uh, the next slide, please, was the third check. So the first check was surface water. The second check was vapor intrusion, and the third check was uh, potable well. We uh, prepare the well search to evaluate if there are any possible potable wells within 0 0.5 miles from the groundwater CA at the site. So uh, what I am usually doing, I am going with this well search which we have on the New Jersey DEP web page and I am uh, searching 0 0.5 miles and one mile two. You see the two uh, circles around the site um, and I am checking then based on that uh, distance to see from the groundwater CA because it, it is another, um, another buffer zone which will be created which will be different from actually what is represented in the PowerPoint presentation. The buffer as Mike pointed out uh, his presentation in his presentation, it's not from the um, site, but it is from the edge of the groundwater CA. So conducted a door-to-door -door survey because we had, as you can see, a well, even uh, that one was up gradient, we checked also uh, we had a door-to-door -door, door survey to identify if there are any other unpermitted wells down gradient of the site. Since the plume was not, exist, uh, was not very long, we actually were able to um, check to have this door-to-door -door survey to identify if we have any unpermitted wells. And we found one and we, it was an irrigation well and we sampled it uh, to, to check to see if it was contaminated with these uh, chlorinated solvents. It, luckily, it was not contaminated. So we didn't have any impact on the receptors. Uh, the next slide, please. So for this um, case now, we could apply actually because we have uh, eight rounds of uh, clean data, we have a stable plume, we have a sentinel well which was installed uh, at the site. Um, the sources of groundwater contamination have been identified and remediated. We have that subslab depressurization system for vapor intrusion. Uh, the concentrations, the groundwater concentration levels do not follow the groundwater elevation fluctuation. Um, and we have concentrations which are uh, less than 10 times the groundwater quality standard. We could apply now for a groundwater remedial action permit, which will uh, be for a CEA with MNA. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned uh, all these uh, items which actually Al presented before. So, uh, I'm wrapping up with uh, what we started, which are the six items which you need to check 
in order to apply for uh, for CEA uh, with MA when you do not have decreasing trends. So last slide, please. So we could apply for sites, uh, the CEA with MA without decreasing trends. Uh, could be applied for sites with low groundwater contaminant levels that have documented asymptotic concentration trends and will have minimal, minimum change, uh, changes in contaminant concentration levels over time. Uh, so for these sites, it is indicated uh, because they have a long duration to perform fate and transport modeling to support these long CA durations um, when you first initially apply for a groundwater remedial action permit. And you should monitor these groundwater contamination trends to evaluate uh, possible CA durations. So usually, you know, you have this uh, depletion, concentration depletion, and the CA duration may change. You may have reached a level where actually your uh, duration may change and be reduced um, in the future, and therefore fit and transport modeling is uh, necessary to be uh, performed to support these long CA durations such as you could change this any time, you have more uh, recent data uh, for modeling. So, next slide, please. If you have any questions, I think they will be addressed later. Yes, yeah, thank you, Al and Liliana, that was great. Um, as Liliana mentioned, if you have questions for them, please enter them in the question box. We're gonna save questions until after our next presenter, however. So I will be welcoming Neil Rivers from Langen to talk about um, moving from active remedy to m a to ultimately groundwater um, wrap termination. So Neil, take it away. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, as, uh, as Jillian just said, I'm going to take us uh, through the transition from active through M&A and to uh, hopefully uh, ultimately site closure. Uh, next slide, please. Let me just establish a, a, a framework, if you will, for a hypothetical site. Um, assume that uh, at that site an active remedy has been implemented um, and through groundwater monitoring, um, you know, we're, we're starting to, to see that treatment may no longer be needed. Uh, we're, we're starting to achieve uh, much lower source area concentrations. Uh, plume concentrations are stable or shrinking. Uh, the plume geochemistry is consistent with contaminant degradation. Um, so things are, starting, things are starting to look good on the, uh, on the success of the active uh, system. Uh, next slide, please. So, so what's next? Uh, well, first, and you've heard it from a few folks this morning, um, you know, let's make sure there are no surprises. Let's, let's consider the potential receptors. Um, you know, revisit the conceptual site model. Make sure that, uh, that, that you've thought about the, the various receptors, the various pathways, and, and um, you know, have, have, don't have something you, you, you've overlooked as, as part of your overall remedy. Um, you want to also assess the potential for success of natural attenuation. If, if I shut down my active system, my active approach, um, do I have a high probability that, that natural attenuation will be successful? For example, perhaps I have a pump and treat system that I'm operating. Um, you know, if, I, if I change the, the, the pumping uh, configuration from, uh, from constant pumping to a pulse pumping, um, and, and look for rebound, that may be a, a mechanism where I could better understand whether there's enough um, back diffusion, enough residual source remaining that uh, modern natural attenuation may not be effective. Um, you also want to consider um, information in the monitor natural attenuation guidance and in the groundwater SIRIRA guidance. Uh, certainly, the uh, M&A guidance uh, provides technical 
lines of evidence for concluding when M&A will be uh, successful. Steve Poston uh, spoke about those uh, effectively this morning. Um, you also want to consider, is there evidence that the active remedy is still ongoing? There may be some amendment residuals uh, that are still present in the subsurface. If you did an in-situ biological treatment uh, program of some type, there may be uh, certain supplements that, that are um, still fostering the, the, um, the degradation, the act of remediation. Um, and, and ultimately, um, you're, you're really still on the tail end of active remediation as opposed to, to being in the M&A zone. In a situation like that, uh, you may need to wait a little bit longer before you begin the sampling to evaluate monitored natural attenuation. Next slide. So before I proceed, um, I'd like to uh, have a quick discussion uh, on a couple of practice pointers, some things to, to consider. Um, uh, first, uh, as you're looking at the potential for a change from active to M&A, uh, you want to make sure you stay in compliance with your current remedial action permit. So wh while you're doing that evaluation, or if you've submitted an application to the department, you still want to continue with your previous permit specified monitoring to the, to the degree that, um, that that's in an existing remedial action permit. Um, there are, however, uh, some older groundwater wraps that don't have a monitoring plan that's designated for the M&A evaluation or long-term uh, M&A monitoring. So you may need to supplement that um, for, your, uh, for your evaluation of M&A, um, you, know, uh, you know, and ultimately understand that once you do achieve M&A or demonstrate M&A, you're going to need a, 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 an updated plan uh, as well. Um, the second consideration is to is to uh, is is related to the initial wrap application. So practice pointer here: if you're if you're submitting a, a groundwater wrap application to the department, um, consider the life cycle of that project. Will it have an active component? You would expect it'll have an M and A component, and so you want to include as part of your overall monitoring program. That, that you place into that permanent application, the various stages of remediation. Don't just put the monitoring program for the active phase, put a monitoring program for uh, M &M, an M&A evaluation phase or a long-term M&A monitoring phase. That way it's all, uh, it's all packaged in, in one permanent application. Okay, next slide please. So back to our, uh, to our hypothetical case, uh, uh, we, we've uh, revisited the conceptual site model. We've thought, we've thought about receptors. Um, and we're, we're thinking, will discontinuing active remediation alter the plume dynamics? That's, that's uh, again, perhaps you, uh, you were pumping, and now that your pump and treat system is shut down, will the flow direction change? Or, in the, in the alternative, you are doing injections, and will the the elimination of these injections and and associated chase, chase water will that alter the flow di dynamics and flow directions? And and ultimately, you need to think about that from the perspective of where do you need your um, your sentinel wells? Where do you need to be evaluating potential receptors, potential water users users? Um, you may also need to consider changes in the property or in groundwater use since the time the original permit application uh, was applied for. Um, have, have buildings been constructed on the property or nearby? So are VI assessments necessary? Um, uh, you know, Liliana spoke, spoke to evaluating uh, that, for example. Uh, are your sentinel well locations appropriate based on what you know now about the site as opposed to what you may have known uh, late earlier. Um, are there new potable supply wells? You know, these are the sorts of things that, that you wanna ask and consider um, as you're evaluating the need to change the overall groundwater monitoring plan. Whether sampling locations, sampling frequency, or, or the compounds that you're testing for. 
Um, next slide. So once you once you've generally satisfied yourself that uh, uh, that the receptors are are, are going to be protected, you want to assess the potential for monitored natural attenuation. Um, you know, largely these are things that were discussed by Steve Poston. Um, you know, the various lines of evidence in the m &A guidance, the, the primary, tertiary, and uh, secondary and tertiary um, uh, evaluation criteria. Uh, as Alex has, has spoken about, uh, eight rounds of uh, post-treatment data are typically needed with at least four consecutive quarter, quarterly events to uh, assess potential seasonal uh, considerations. <clears throat> Excuse me, you also want to sample throughout the plume, uh, not just at uh, fringes or not just at a source well, but you, know, you want to evaluate rebound in the treatment zone. You want to assess vertical and horizontal conditions, um, lateral downgraded conditions at the site, um, and again, consider that seasonal variability. So you want to make sure you're measuring groundwater elevations. Next slide. So assuming that uh, you've gone through that process, the groundwater monitoring after uh, eight, eight events is successful, um, it's, uh, you know, it's now time to shift to an M&A uh, program and a M&A based remedial action permit. Administratively, what does that entail? Uh, it entails the uh, application uh, of, a, of a RAP modification application form a cover letter or report explaining the reason for the modification. Again, um, you know, the, the permit writer, the permit reviewer is not necessarily going to know all the details in the history. Um, and so you're, you're providing an, an update, if you will, to the prior remedial action report, uh, explaining, the, explaining the, the site conditions and the changes over time and the basis for shifting from active to MNA. Uh, you're providing the monitoring results and, and, and modeling data. Uh, Mike Gaudio showed you the, this, the, the data table, for example, as, as, a, uh, as some of the information you're gonna provide. You're gonna provide concentrations, depth of water, groundwater elevation contours, um, and include secondary and tertiary lines of evidence if they're applicable. Uh, and ultimately an updated CEA and WRA fact sheet form. Next slide, please. So as part of the permit modification, you're also going to provide an updated long-term monitoring plan. Um, again, here, refer to the M&A technical guidance. Um, you know, that, that guidance document gives you uh, information in terms of uh, recommended um, uh, sampling plan um, uh, considerations, uh, sampling frequencies, analytical suites, and, th and things of that nature. Um, you know, on an initial basis, uh, as I think Alex mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that that, uh, that initial M&A um, uh, monitoring plan uh, is going to include enough sampling to verify the long-term viability of monitored natural attenuation and the overall protection of receptors. Um, the, the monitoring plan may have, as I mentioned earlier, may have changes in sampling frequently, fr frequency or the analytical suite over a period of time, um, as long as you're being protective of receptors. So you want to consider, um, obviously, the specific compounds that are associated with your case, the ones that are going to degrade more quickly um, um, or, or be more recalcitrant, uh, for example. Um, you want to consider a VI monitoring plan if, if that's applicable uh, and include that as part of the permit mod application. Um, uh, again, you're going to, you're going to over time consider changes, uh, you know, perhaps with greater frequency at first and, and um, and then a shift to less frequently over time. Um, or perhaps as part of your monitoring plan, you have a BTEX plume with relatively low concentrations and an aerobic aquifer, and you may want to do sampling more frequently um, and, uh, you know, in, the, in the hopes of more quickly demonstrating that you've achieved groundwater quality standards and, 
and ultimately site closure. Um, your application is also going to include uh, OMMN plans for the VI mitigation and for POETS if, if those are part of the program. Uh, the next slide. So I've taken you through the change from active to MA. Um, let me add as a you know, sort of the next step here about the transition from MA to uh, to closure. Next slide. So by way of background, here's our, you know, here's our site. We we've uh, we've conducted the the remediation on the property. And our groundwater data indicates that uh, perhaps we're, we're complying with the groundwater quality standard um, or the modeled CEA duration is approaching. You know, what's, our, what's our next step? Next slide, please. Well, we're gonna conduct a minimum of two successive rounds of groundwater sampling for concentration data. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the expectation of these two successive rounds and, and uh, is is established in the ARCS rules, uh, 726C at 7.9F. There'll be a minimum of 90 days between those events. The expectation is that at least one of those rounds will be biased to the expected highest concentration based on historical data considering things like seasonal variability. Uh, next slide. You also need to do compliance sam sampling that's going to demonstrate that you achieve compliance throughout the entire plume, both vertically and horizontally, um, not, not just uh, at, at one or two locations or at a source well, uh, for example. Um, remember, the plume can change over time. Um, uh, ground, ground, horizontal, or so to say vertical groundwater flow um, uh, caused by regional pumping, perhaps. Um, or uh, uh, surface water infiltration can influence uh, the location of the plume. Uh, so you want to make sure that, that your analysis for compliance to groundwater standards has, has met, um, you know, the, the, or considered those uh, conditions. Um, and also per the field sampling procedures manual, uh, the department expects that uh, the last two rounds of sampling are going to be done using a volume average purge. Now, you may be doing a significant amount of passive diffusion bag or low flow sampling uh, as part of the ongoing monitoring, but, uh, but I want to call your attention to this element of the, of the field sampling procedures manual. So if you're not going to use those uh, two rounds uh, at, through volume average purge, uh, you do need, as an LSRP, to provide the technical basis for a deviation from the guidance. Next slide, please. So let's uh, let's have our two rounds of sampling. Assume that uh, that everything achieves groundwater quality standards. We've got success. Um, next step is to terminate the CEA and the remedial action permit. So administratively, that's a remedial action permit termination application form, a cover letter report justifying the termination and providing the groundwater monitoring results. And, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, Alex and his team will, uh, will, will agree with you and, and will uh, terminate the permit. Next slide. So one reminder, you do not need to issue another response action outcome in this setting. In this setting, you've previously prepared a limited restricted use REO. And so with a limited restricted use REO plus a groundwater wrap termination, that's the equivalent of an unrestricted groundwater REO. You don't need to produce that final unrestricted groundwater REO. I think that uh, wraps it up for me. Check next slide. We're open for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, we have reached our next uh, question portion of this presentation. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions um, geared toward Neil, Al, Liliana first. Um, first question, what is the department's view on MNA sampling that stops sampling wells as time goes by when they have compliant results, but key wells such as source down gradient wells were or are still sampled? 
Uh, can you repeat that question one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. What is the department's view on MNA sampling that stops sampling wells as time goes by when they have compliant results? Uh, but key wells such as source or down gradient wells were or are still sampled? I mean, there are situations where that can be fine. It's kind of on a site by site basis. You know, like if the plume is shrinking, let's say, and you start to get some of those <coughs> plume fringe wells that are cleaning up, it might make more sense to, rather than stop sampling those plume fringe wells, to kind of condense your monitoring well network, possibly, if everything is starting to shrink. And there can be other wells that turn out to be clean eventually as part of your sampling plan that can still be useful. But uh, as long as the LSRP justifies certain wells don't need to be sampled anymore, it's fine to slowly take wells out. You may just need a uh, a permit modification to identify which wells won't be sampled anymore as part of the groundwater monitoring plan. Thank you for that. Next question, does the reduction of analytical parameters require a permit modification? Should we try to account for per future permit monitoring changes in the initial monitoring plan submitted with the RAP application? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're gonna start sampling for less things uh, and your permit says that you have to sample for those things, you would need a permit modification to uh, reduce those analytical parameters. Um, I mean, I will say a lot of times the RAP won't issue permits that have very specific conditions in them. So you may be able to do some general things. Like the, one of the biggest things we do is the tiered sampling approach. It's outlined in the MA guidance document. So you can propose more frequent sampling, which reduces over time, assuming contaminant concentrations are going down as predicted. Um, but in terms of removing analytical parameters over time, I haven't written any permits like that. I would think you'd probably need a permit modification. Okay. Now this question's for Liliana. What specifically are you looking at and evaluating when you, are, when you compare your contaminant concentrations against your groundwater elevations? So if they were in the same time, you have um, increasing groundwater um, elevation and uh, decreasing groundwater concentrations. This means actually that you are uh, you have more water and you dissolve your contamination, which still exists bounded to the clay layers in the aquifer. So if you have uh, always this variation, um, higher uh, groundwater elevation and lower groundwater concentration, this means you have a trend and uh, this is a reason actually your uh, contamination concentration is not decreasing this time. Thank you. Next question. Is long-term sampling in the source area required for the groundwater monitoring plan or are sentinel delineation wells sufficient? Well, we generally recommend that sampling in the source area be continued as part of the groundwater monitoring plan. Uh, I think the department views sampling of the sentinel wells as most important because they're typically what is showing that the m a remedy is protective of receptors, but we do recommend that source area wells be sampled generally as frequently as sentinel wells when possible. Yeah, because you want to just add on to what Al saying is you want to make sure to continue to demonstrate that uh, natural attenuation is uh, is a current is predicted, so we, we do want to make sure sampling uh, confirms that. Thank you. Next question. Should CVOC breakdown products be included in the wrap for PCE and TCE? Include DCE and vinyl chloride since the concentrations of the breakdown products may increase during the MA period? Yeah, we always request that breakdown compounds be included in the groundwater monitoring plan. So if you have PCE, we would want to see all the daughter compounds included in the groundwater monitoring plan. We generally 
would recommend that you list something that pretty inclusive, like either volatile organics or chlorinated organics. Well, in general, I want to mention something. So in general, we are actually sampling for all VOCs, even if we have only chlorinated solvents. So uh, to make sure that all the degradation is not only vinyl chloride and cis-1 to uh, DCE, but cis and trans-1 to DCE, but there are others which may appear later on. It was asked earlier, but unclear, that for groundwater cases where only tentatively, tentatively identified compounds remain, no other contaminants of concern. What is the DEP stance on MNA via RAP? Uh, I mean, generally, you would have to keep the CEA in place under an MNA wrap until the ticks met the the, uh, the interim criteria that are listed on our website that we use for ticks. Yeah, our, our, our policy on ticks is the same as anything else. I mean, we understand that it's difficult to, you know, get contaminant uh, trends with it. And, you know, we recommend, you know, try and, uh, you know, if you could pull out a particular contaminant or if you get in common uh, individual ticks, uh, to try to do some type of analysis that way, but yeah, we, we treat ticks like any any other contaminant where we expect uh, uh, that natural attenuation be occurring, and, and we, we do understand that it could be difficult in uh, determining trends uh, sometimes with that. I want to. I'm sorry. Go ahead, you can go, Liliana. Something for ticks. So usually you are checking which are your ticks, and you see, you know, maybe you have a benzene constituent, and then you use it as a surrogate to model it eventually for the CA duration if you have only ticks. So we had a site like this in which the only constituent of concern was tick, the ticks. And so what are you doing? And uh, uh, it was a good approach. I think it worked. Yeah, and, and Rob Hawk and, and Mark Fisher will be talking about that uh, later on. They have a FAQ uh, that talks about ticks, so uh, there, there should be some more useful information coming on that topic. Thank you. Another question. Can geochemical or isotopic data to show degradation be used to support vertical delineation in a deep well exceeding groundwater quality standard for an RAR, or is that considered modeling and not acceptable? Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I mean, we do want to see actual clean data in a deep well. Um, I don't know if anybody else had further comment. Yeah, this, this is Steve. Um, I mean, the, the isotope data is real data, so it's not modeling. But as Alex said, you could use that to show the presence of degradation. But, you know, ultimately, you still need to meet the uh, groundwater quality standards at the end of the M&A period. Steve, I would agree. The other thing that you might consider using CSIA for um, is a commingling of plumes. And so there may be a way that you can tease some of the um, some of the concentrations out from the lower uh, depth interval uh, as being related to, to commingled. At this point, we are going to move on to our next two presenters. Um, thank you guys. Thank you, Liliana, Al, Neil. Thank you. Oh, let's see. Sorry, I cannot find my exit. While you're exiting, I'm going to introduce um, the next two presenters, Dominic Hudica and Richard Lake. Um, where they will be doing 
presenting on some frequently asked questions related to the Monitor Natural Attenuation Technical Guidance Document. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Dominic Kudica. I'm a reviewer with the Bureau of Inspection and Review. Rich, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, Rich Lake, an LSRP with Geotechnology Associates with about 25 years of experience of remediation in New Jersey. So as Liz said, um, we're going to be going through some Q&A questions we came up with uh, for the M&A technical guidance. Um, so next slide, please. Rich, if you want to start us off with the first question. Sure. So this topic's been mentioned a couple times already in the presentation, but you know, in general, can I begin sampling for my eight rounds immediately after groundwater remediation has ended? So uh, once active groundwater remediation has been completed for a site, sufficient sampling should be occurring to demonstrate that the active remedy is no longer enhancing natural attenuation um, as detailed more in the guidance and, and we'll discuss further in the next question. Uh, any groundwater data collected to support an m and determination should be conducted once the aquifer has time uh, has had time to reach equilibrium. Next slide, please. Uh, so when does the department consider an aquifer as being in equilibrium after groundwater remediation has been conducted? This determination is generally made by evaluating the presence of reagents or amendments that were injected or otherwise discharged as part of your remediation. Um, and it would be helpful to look at levels prior to, during, and after your treatment to really look at what was, what may be there from that act of remediation. So if you can say at the end of the day that there may be some reagents or byproducts in groundwater, but they're not influencing the attenuation, that the attenuation you really are seeing is due to natural attenuation, then I think you're ready to do your monitoring to prove m is applicable. Next slide. Can I use groundwater data collected from my SI or RI phases as part of my eight rounds of sampling? So the short answer is yes, um, as long as this groundwater data was collected after any active soil or groundwater mediation was conducted, uh, it can be used from pretty much any remedial phase. For example, um, if you had a UST excavation uh, and then you um, conducted some sampling, found soil contamination, and then subsequently that soil contamination was excavated at a later time. Um, but depending on the extent of contamination and if additional remediation had occurred uh, since the SI or RI phase, uh, the LSRP should be using their independent professional judgment uh, when making the determination uh, for using historic data uh, for evaluating m and And we also have uh, some additional questions coming up in regards to historic data. So next slide, please. So I have a historic site where the four quarterly groundwater samples were conducted greater than 10 years ago. Uh, do I need to conduct an additional four rounds of quarterly samples today? And, and I'll clarify this question a little bit. There was an edit that didn't get carried through here. Um, but the intent was, you know, did, if you had four quarterly groundwater samples 10 years ago and you've done annual sampling since that period, do you need to step back and do quarterly sampling again as part of your demonstration of m &A? and this is really a, a, an independent professional judgment call. Um, I mean, the idea of the quarterly sampling is to evaluate seasonal trends and you know, try to, if you're going to do long-term monitoring, target what, what time of the year you may sample or to evaluate if, if there's any source area there. So, you know, one thing you might need to consider is have conditions changed over those 10 years? I mean, if this were my site, I would probably get another round of four quarterly rounds um, just to take a look at that again since it's been so long. Next slide. So I did not conduct an, an active groundwater remediation. Do I still need eight rounds of sampling to demonstrate that m and is applicable? So yes, regardless of if active groundwater remediation has been conducted, because for many sites uh, it's not necessary, uh, the minimum uh, amount of eight rounds of sampling is required, uh, which is in the guidance um, for evaluating m and 
conducting anything less than eight rounds of sampling uh, is a deviation from guidance and requires additional professional judgment and lines of evidence uh, to be included within the remedial action report and uh, remedial action permit application, uh, which is pursuant to the, the technical requirements of site remediation. Next slide, please. Uh, what if I cannot obtain eight rounds of samples before my remedial action regulatory time frame? Well, obviously the first answer is apply for an extension if you qualify. But you may also want to consider whether or not less than eight rounds will be sufficient for your site to show that M&A is applicable. Just note that, you know, as Dominic said, this is a deviation from guidance and you'll have to provide the lines of evidence supporting that deviation in your RAP application and your RAR. Next slide. Should I use the recommended monitoring well sampling frequency for M&A that's in the M&A guidance when I have a non-decreasing trend situation? So in general, uh, the monitoring well sampling frequency suggested within the guidance is to be used for uh, situations where there is a clear decreasing trend um, for historic groundwater data that should be evaluated uh, to develop an appropriate monitoring frequency for source area wells and for sentinel wells, uh, a sampling frequency should be based on the methods outlined within the guidance. Next slide, please. Uh, so do all wells installed at the SIRI phase need to be sampled as part of the performance monitoring program and included within the long-term monitoring program? So in many cases, uh, you'll have a significant number of wells that were installed as par part of the SI and the RI phases. Um, you know, typically there's an iterative process and step out sampling protocol that's used that may result in you having more wells than you really need to use for your groundwater monitoring plan. So the wells selected for your plan should be based on the distribution of the groundwater contaminants, your site-specific hydrogeology, and should include all impacted units. It should be sufficient to answer that question at the end of the day, whether or not trends are continuing to decrease or whether or not your receptors remain to be protected. So I, I recommend providing very simple language in your RAP application to justify any transition from a certain number of wells that you used for MNA to what you wanna have in your program especially for wells that were traditionally contaminated. If you want to cut those off of your program, give a good reason why. Next slide. All right, so that's the end of Rich and Dominic's section. So thank you guys so much for that. Next, we're gonna welcome um, Rob Hawk from Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting and um, LSRP Mark Fisher from ELM Group to talk about the groundwater rep um, frequently asked questions. Great, thanks everybody. Uh, the, uh, we're getting close to the end here. We, uh, we saved the best for last, of course. Talking about Rob, not me, but uh, next slide, please. So first question, this has to do with variances. We talked a lot about that today. Uh, can I vary from the tech, uh, tech requirements or guidance if it's appropriate and how do I do that and how do I document that? So uh, yes, deviations from guidance and variances from the tech regs are acceptable. As Mike Gaudio mentioned earlier in his presentation on groundwater wrap applications, forms, processes, and uh, common deficiencies, both variances from rule and deviations from guidance must be documented and professional judgment must be provided in the RAR as well as on the RAP application under other information provided. And other information provided on the RAP application needs to reference where in the RAR multiple lines of evidence was provided to support your variance or deviation. So the, one of the things I'll say about this, this is a pretty common omission if you talk to the department. I think, um, I think uh, LSRBs and practitioners are getting better about, you know, specifically including variances. Um, you know, I, essentially, you know, don't bury it, you know, identify it as a variance or a deviation, call it out in your report um, and address it head on with multiple lines of evidence um, and independent professional judgment. Um, also, when it comes to variances, 
be sure that you're following what the criteria is in the tech rule. There is very specific things that you have to include. It's largely administrative, but I think for completeness, make sure you cite that reference and include those criteria that are included there. Uh, and I think the last thing to mention here that again was mentioned several times today is that the reviewers don't have the history that the practitioner or the LSRP have. So um, really think about how you're telling your story, particularly when it deals with variances or deviations. Be thorough, um, include if there's information from prior reports, you know, include those sections of the reports uh, or reintroduce re them into your RAR or your RAP permit application to make sure everything's complete. Next slide. Question about free and residual product. When is it appropriate to apply for a groundwater M&A wrap uh, for a site if there's been a history of free or residual product? So the wrap application should be submitted after post remedial sampling data shows that all free and residual product has been treated or removed from the entire historically mapped extent of free and residual product, the impacted monitoring wells and the surrounding area, and the area within the effective radius of influence of any prior active remediation that may have occurred. Uh, please note that post remedial sampling should also be included on the groundwater monitoring plan for active groundwater permits for free and residual product. So, um, you know, we've talked about it, a lot of things today that are, you know, what I would consider sort of red flags. Uh, I think we're all always looking for those things. What are some of the hot buttons or what are the, some of the things that will typically trigger, you know, extra scrutiny uh, from a permit reviewer? And in the presence of free residual product, um, historically, when you're going for M&A is one of those things. So, again, make sure you're addressing these things uh, directly. Uh, a lot of times it'll be a function of, you know, what was the magnitude of the residual product or free product issue leading up to M&A? You know, when was it last identified? Uh, how, how, how much of an extent was it? Did you have just a sheen or did you have, you know, eight feet of product? All those things are going to dictate what's the appropriate criteria for demonstrating that that free or residual product is gone. Uh, and in some instances, it's going to require some supplemental sampling to document that. Uh, other instances, it will not. Again, I think this is a, you know, one of those sort of professional judgment uh, considerations. Uh, but again, make sure that uh, you're factoring these things in and you're not ignoring it when your site does have one of these conditions. Uh, if you're not sure, if you think you've got sort of a, you know, a unique condition, by all means, you know, ask for a tech consult with the, with the BRAP folks um, to address what questions you might have. Next slide. TI. Uh, a de TI determination was made for my site. What kind of wrap do I utilize in this situation? So if it was determined that TI is appropriate at your site, you should send an active groundwater wrap application. Please note before sending your active wrap application that any product that is possible to remove should be removed and any product that is technically impracticable to remove or treat should be contained and therefore not reach any sentinel or delineation wells. And lastly, please note before you send an active RAP application, it is strongly recommended that you reach out to the Bureau of Groundwater Pollution Abatement to set up a joint technical consultation with them and uh, the Bureau of Remedial Action Permitting. Instructions on scheduling a Technical consultation can be found on the department's website at the links shown on this slide. So one key thing to remember here, and this is something I think that some people get confused with, is that TI is not M&A. They're very different things. Uh, they're similarly monitored, I think, but uh, TI is a very different, different animal. Uh, the good news is, is that the department actually has been approving TI for, for some sites. Uh, there was actually just a... Uh, uh, a seminar that the LSRPA did about a, a couple of weeks ago on TI. Uh, we went into some of these details. Um, like Rob said, technical consultation is probably really highly recommended in these situations. Uh, our firm has a couple of these that are pending. We actually are doing sort of sequential um, tech consults where we'll, you know, we we think we're going this way. Maybe we're just we're through with the RI. We're developing our lines of evidence for TI. We've had some meetings. Uh, to sort of discuss what we think our data gaps are, to sort of get the department's technical team on board with regard to TI, to sort of, you know, grease the skids when they, ultimately the application comes in. 
Um, the other thing I think to remember too is that, you know, in, in many instances, the department will be looking for some sort of uh, hydraulic containment or physical barriers, uh, particularly if you've got uh, what they would consider significant residual source left, whether it's, you know, bound up in the aquifer, et cetera. Uh, that's not going to be in every instance, but um, that's one of those things you're going to have to factor in when you're looking at whether TI is appropriate for your site. Um, uh, associated with that, and that's one of the reasons why they put the TI into the active groundwater wrap category uh, with the expectation that there, you know, may be some sort of hydraulic containment or containment of, of uh, the source area material, uh, in which case you'd have to then also submit your FA as part of that uh, active part of your uh, TI component. Next slide. Subdivisions. So my site's been subdivided. Which portion of the new subdivision parcels gets the wrap and what's considered the site at this point? So whenever a, a property is subdivided, the parcel that contains the source area will, uh, would require a wrap and only that parcel would be considered on-site. Any former on-site parcel that does not contain a source area would now be considered off-site. Splitting source areas associated with groundwater contamination via subdivision is not recommended, as this would create more than one site, meaning uh, new program interests would need to be created for each portion of the former source area on, on different parcels, and they would require more than one groundwater wrap application. Fortunately, it's very uncommon for source areas to be split. To my knowledge, there's only been one case so far uh, where this has been an issue. Yeah, you'd have to have a pretty giant source area to result in, uh, you know, having a splitting of that where you get uh, where you get two source areas uh, split by those parcels, uh, like Rob said. So it's a pretty unique situation when that happens. And, and sometimes, again, it's a it's a judgment call as to you know where the quote majority of the source for your for your plume originated from. But usually, you can you can develop some reasonable lines of evidence to support that. Um, like I said, uh, you know, it is possible that you could have, uh, you know, a scenario like Rob described where you need two, two permits, but hopefully you can sort of win the day on that uh, if that situation occurs. Um, one of the other things to think about too is that um, there may be some older sites um, where there was one groundwood wrap that was issued, but there were actually two separate plumes. Uh, it's a little different what we're talking about here, but it's sort of related. Uh, it's possible that um, if those two separate plumes are on different parcels of the site, the department will come back and ask for separate permits uh, if those parcels are now owned by two different entities. So just sort of keep that in mind, sort of related to this. Next slide. Sort of a related question of sites that have multiple CEAs. Um, if I have multiple releases, multiple plumes, uh, do they require separate wraps and separate CEAs? So the, uh, the department recommends a separate initial groundwater wrap application, CEA WRA fact sheet form, and groundwater monitoring plan for each distinct source area or groundwater contaminant plume at the site. Uh, this recommendation is based on several reasons, including that CEA durations will vary by contaminants of concern. Um, smaller C, uh, groundwater monitoring plans, uh, which uh, means fewer potential modifications to a groundwater wrap and uh, cuts down on our permit application uh, reviews times, especially on large complex sites. Please be advised that this is only a recommendation, uh, not a requirement, and please contact BRAP for any questions about this recommendation. Yeah, so we, we touched upon this obviously on the last slide, but uh, the good news is you do have the option here. Uh, like Rob said, I think it's important to look at that critically from sort of a long-term perspective. And yes, it does sound great to have a single permit versus two or three permits, uh, if that's what sort of uh, you have at your site. Um, but um, in a scenario where you do have to make some modifications or expect one to terminate before the other, um, you could ultimately end up spending more money to deal with just the administrative components of that to sort of decouple those single plumes within one permit. So again, just think about this uh, critically uh, if you have that type of scenario. Next slide. Ooh, let me test your knowledge. 
Here we have our fourth and final test your knowledge question. Um, just a reminder, you have to answer three out of the four to get credit for today. So if you have not, if you missed one and have not done so, please answer this question to get your credits. Um, this last question, for cases with an approved TI determination, a blank groundwater wrap application should be submitted. A, a monitor nat natural attenuation, B, active remediation, C, technical impracticability, or D, none of the above. Have a minute. Just waiting on a few more folks. Well, we're waiting for the rest of the vote, um, answers to come in. Just a reminder to you um, to fill out our survey monkey. I put the link in the chat again. Um, it really helps us out. We're going to move along. The answer is B, active remediation. Mark Rob, take it away. Uh, as promised, here are a couple slides about ticks. So first the question, how do I calculate and list the total and individual ticks for my permit application? So uh, total ticks is the sum of volatile organic ticks and semi-volatile organic ticks, uh, unless only one or the other are required to be sampled at your site. Uh, the VO plus SVO tick total should be reported on the CEAWRA fact sheet form as total ticks and compared to the applicable groundwater remediation standard of 500 micrograms per liter. Total ticks should ideally include 15 VO ticks and 15 SVO ticks, but you may come up with less than that if there aren't that many ticks at your site. Uh, if you have less than 15 of each, just compare the ticks that you do have to the applicable standards. Uh, the concentration of the highest individual VO or SVO uh, tick used to calculate total ticks should be recorded on the CEA WRA fact sheet form as individual ticks, and that concentration should be compared to uh, the applicable. Uh, groundwater remediation standard of 100 micrograms per liter. So uh, as somebody had a question earlier about ticks, you know, whether the department quote regulates them with the permit uh, process, and yes, they, they obviously do. Ticks are technically a standard uh, in the groundwater quality standards in the uh, remediation standard document. So you gotta deal with them. Um, they are a little bit challenging, uh, and this is sort of an evolving topic. I think as more sites come through with tick applications uh, for wraps, um, I think the department uh, will be coming up with maybe some guidance document or frequently asked question document to deal with ticks. Um, and there are some, you know, unique nuances with sites with ticks. So let's go to the next slide. So a contaminant that is typically a targeted compound shows up in the lab results in my tick scan. How do I deal with that? So this happens sometimes if a contaminant with a groundwater remediation standard is included on your VO or SVO uh, tick data that's provided uh, by your lab, uh, for example, ethyl benzene or naphthalene, you should revise the total ticks to not include that compound as it should not be considered a tick. Uh, you would need, um, if you need to remove a contaminant from VO or SVO ticks, uh, the individual tick with the next highest concentration should be added in its place to ensure uh, that you keep that 15, a total of 15 for each VO and SVO uh, ticks in your total tick count. Please note that there are other rare, rare situations that may require removing a tick from your scan. Uh, uh, for questions on tick sampling or for your specific results, please contact the Office of Data Quality. Yes, so again, ticks can be a little complicated. Um, you know, uh, most of us aren't analytical chemists, so we are looking at these scans and trying to make some decisions about, you know, is this the same compound, is it not? Is it duplicated in the VO versus the SVO scan? You know, how do you do that? 
Uh, certainly your, your lab uh, uh, folks are often helpful with, with trying to digest this. And, and like Rob said, Greg Toffoli can be helpful as well uh, with regard to, you know, if you're getting creative about how to manage these, these ticks. Um, be careful with duplicates. Um, you know, when you do see the same, what appears to be the same compound in a BO or an SVO library uh, scan, sometimes they, they are, sometimes they're not. Uh, and there's ways to sort of sort that out. Again, if you talk to the, uh, the bench chemist at the, at the lab, he can help you sort of sort that out a little bit. Um, the, um, the other thing that I think Rob mentioned, too, is that there are a lot of instances where you don't have 15 ticks that come up in your scan. You only have eight or 10, and that's okay. Uh, I think you just have to make sure that that's clearly documented um, in that way. If you do end up replacing one, you don't have another one to insert back in. Uh, that's okay as well. Just make sure you're explaining all that stuff. So uh, again, sort of an evolving topic, but one I think the department recognizes that uh, a little bit more guidance uh, is necessary with regard to those scenarios. Next slide. Permit terminations. When should I terminate my permit? So a groundwater wrap termination application can be submitted after a minimum of two consecutive sampling events uh, accounting for seasonal fluctuations, so at least 90 days apart. Uh, show results below groundwater remediation standards for all contaminants of concern in all wells on the groundwater monitoring plan, including sentinel wells. And one of those two rounds target the month or season with historic high, con uh, historic high contaminant concentrations. And the number of groundwater samples is representative of the entire horizontal and vertical extent of the groundwater CEA. If your permit includes anything pertaining to VI, for example, subslab so soil gas contamination that exceeds residential soil gas screening levels at a non-residential structure, a VI long-term monitoring plan, and a VI engineering controller mitigation system, or an indeterminate VI pathway status, VI sampling in accordance with the vapor intrusion technical guidance document will also be necessary prior to submitting a wrap termination application. So there's quite a bit to unpack here. Some of these uh, bullets were sort of spoken about in some of the other presentations, but um, you know, I think some of the key takeaways here in terms of things that you really need to be carefully evaluating are the water table fluctuation issue. The department is specifically looking for you know, the LSRP to document how that situation is being uh, evaluated. Uh, and uh, like was in some of the previous uh, questions, you know, you can use historical data if it's appropriate. Again, explain why, you know, uh, your seasonal variability uh, evaluation includes data from five years ago. Um, yeah, there's ways to sort of justify that with multiple lines of evidence. Um, I think one of the other things to think about relative to the um, com the two compliant rounds is, you know, look at your permit, uh, the wells that are, are in your permit. Uh, in some instances, you may have wells that are only sampled annually. You know, if you have a longer, uh, or uh, let's say every, you have some wells that are sampled annually, some wells are sampled every four years uh, uh, for some of the longer permits. Uh, the department will be looking to document that, you know, if you have one of those wells that was sampled four years ago and it still had an exceedance, maybe you're not scheduled to sample that as part of your monitoring schedule, but you want to terminate your permit, they're going to probably look to ensure that that well is compliant. So uh, there may be some things that you need to do uh, in looking at your well monitoring well network critically to satisfy the, term the termination criteria. Uh, and I think the last thing to sort of be mindful of relative to VI is particularly if your VI program includes indoor air monitoring as part of your permit compliance, make sure you're doing that uh, indoor air monitoring during the heating season. Sort of, again, sort of be proactively looking at when to schedule that work so you can satisfy that, that criteria. Next slide. Increasing trends under an existing M&A wrap. Um, so what happens if contaminant concentrations increase during my last sampling event? Should I, do I need to transition to, from an M&A wrap to an active wrap? How do I handle that situation? So not necessarily. Um, if a new release is not suspected, and uh, you should take additional rounds to see if there continues to be an increasing trend. And then 
if there isn't an increasing trend, so the results are stable or decreasing and concentrations aren't um, high or fluctuating significantly, the groundwater MA permit may still be appropriate. If there is an increasing trend and you plan to treat via a continuously operating long-term system, then you will need to modify the uh, m and wrap to be an active wrap. If there's an increasing trend, but it seems appropriate to treat via something other than a continuously operating system, for example, a one-time injection event, then you can apply for a permit by rule uh, through Bureau of Groundwater Pollution Abatement. Assuming it doesn't cause any adverse effects, this one-time uh, treatment would not require a wrap modification to go from m and to active. And then there's some other strategies that you may want to consider as well when this when this happens. You know, look, you know, we all have seen groundwater concentrations fluctuate over time. That's a surprise, particularly when you're in sort of former source areas and things like that, where you expect to see a little bit of variability. But um, if you see something significant happening, where it's happening on a more consistent basis, yeah, it's 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 definitely going to trigger, you know. Uh, a red flag from the department's perspective. So one of the things you may think about doing is, you know, nobody likes to add more sampling data, but sometimes additional data, even if it's not within the uh, confines of your permit uh, sampling schedule, that additional data may help justify why this isn't a concern. So think about doing those things. Uh, the other thing to really focus on when this happens is receptors. Make sure that if you do see some of that variability, you can justify through other data within your monitoring well network uh, and your previous receptor evaluations that it's not a risk to any any receptors. That's going to be something I think that that is a, a relative to this. Next slide. Uh, sort of related to uh, what some uh, that Rob, Rob just mentioned earlier. Um, if you do get a PBR during your permit uh, M&A monitoring. Uh, to sort of drop maybe source area concentrations or to reduce the longevity for whatever reason. Uh, what should I do if there's adverse effects associated with the injection? So if there are negative effects from the treatment performed, such as significant plume displacement or adding additional contaminants to the plume, like sodium uh, from a sodium persulfate injection or something like that, that are still present above the standards when the next biennial evaluation is completed, then the investigator is expected to submit a groundwater wrap modification application to update the permit as necessary. So I think, again, uh, this is probably not too common. I mean, I know we, people do use PBRs during uh, M&A wraps to, to sort of accomplish some of those objectives that I mentioned earlier. Um, well, one of the things that I think Rich mentioned uh, in his uh, question session earlier was, you know, to, to do things like baseline sampling for those compounds like sodium. A lot of times the naturally uh, occurring background uh, concentration of those compounds is already pretty high. So um, it's important to know that before you go in. If you don't have that data and, and you're trying to justify what the pre-existing conditions were, you don't really have any baseline to go upon. So again, think about those types of things. Uh, and again, talking to the, uh, the the permit reviewers and the folks in BRAP, it's 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 fairly uncommon that that they would require a permit mod for one of those uh, non uh, discharge contaminants uh, that might be associated with your with your with your uh, PBR. But again. Think about it, uh, and if you have any questions, uh, if you do encounter that situation, it's always best to reach out to someone. Next slide. So this one has to do with previously approved CEA. So my CEA was approved with modeling during my RI stage. Um, do I need to revise my CEA when I get to the groundwater uh, permit applications phase? So if the shape was based on modeling, then and yes, the shape should be revised. As, as Mike Gaudio mentioned in his presentation, per section four of the department's uh, policy statement, interpretation of technical requirements for site remediations, requirement to complete a remedial investigation. When applying for a permit during the remedial action phase, the CEA boundaries should be defined by clean, meaning below ground, uh, applicable groundwater remediation standards, delineation wells and sentinel wells in all directions, unless significant information exists that support a smaller CEA footprint. 
essentially connect the dots between all your clean wells. This is kind of a no-brainer. I think most people know that when you submit your final RAR uh, for groundwater that you need to resubmit your CEA. Uh, and a lot of times it's in, your, it's in your best interest to do that by that time. Uh, if you did some modeling or extrapolation in your RI, you've now collected some data, maybe you can shrink down that footprint that works to your advantage. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been stated a lot that, you know, modeling is not accepted for the purposes of establishing compliance at the, uh, the RA phase and the groundwater permit phase. But, uh, you know, you do actually do use modeling when it comes to longevity. So don't misinterpret what I think what, what some folks are saying about when modeling can and can't be used in this phase. Um, and like Rob mentioned, th there are situations where, you know, you may use modeling. Um, to justify uh, that you can't put in a, you know, a certain compliance well, whether it's a side gradient well or another well within your plume network for whatever reason. Uh, you know, again, if, if you can't, like Rob said, connect the dots with your existing well network and you have a justifiable reason, that's a barrier. So make sure you include that in your, in your, in your submission. Next slide. Primary contact for permit compliance. What is this? What is a PCPC? There's a lot of tongue twisters in here. <laughs> the primary contact for permit compliance, formerly known as primary responsibility for permit compliance, is whichever co-permittee, be that the person responsible for conducting remediation or the property owner who agrees to be the department's primary co-permittee contact for compliance issues. They are simply the entity that will contact first if we can't reach the LSRP or if one is for some reason not retained. Um, it's an internal designation that isn't listed on the permit. It used to be, but it would too, too often be confused with the person responsible for conducting remediation. People would often get confused thinking that the person responsible for conducting remediation wasn't responsible for the permit if, say, for instance, the owner was listed as the primary contact for permit compliance. So to be clear, even though one entity is called the primary contact for permit compliance, all permittees are jointly and severally liable for permit compliance. So I think it's a, a little known fact that the department has a policy, internal policy, that I think they have to create at least one new acronym every year. So this was uh, the 2022 new acronym, the PCPC. Uh, but 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 like Rob said, the most important thing is, and I, it is a common misconception, I think, that um, if you're not the primary contact for permit compliance or whatever we used to call that person or entity, um, that uh, you're off the hook. You're not you're not responsible for compliance. You are, uh, like Rob said, you're joint and severally liable if you're the PC. Uh, PRCR, uh, you never come off the permit, even if the, let's say the property owner has taken responsibility for compliance. So um, a, a lot of times there'll be separate contractual agreements between parties to you know make sure that the right entity is taking responsibility, uh, but the department doesn't recognize those. So if there's a compliance problem, uh, they will uh, initially contact the PCPC, but if that can't get resolved, then all the parties that are responsible parties under the permit will be responsible for compliance. So let's keep that in mind. Next slide. Last question uh, has to do with RAP uh, biennial certs. So some of my monitoring wells on my permit couldn't be sampled during the last sampling event and my next uh, buy cert is due. Uh, what should I do here? Should I send the form in? Should I how, how do you handle that situation? So if there are wells in your groundwater monitoring plan that can't be accessed for sampling before the next buy cert is due, the department recommends sampling the monitoring wells as soon as possible, but yet you still maintain the buy cert schedule that's in your permit. Uh, you should just explain the, it should explain the issue in the biennial certification form that is due and include any missing groundwater data along with any new data in the following buy cert. So the most important takeaway here is don't miss a buy cert submission. Um, you know, I think there are, you know, there's scenarios where you might be late for whatever reason you need an extra week or maybe even a month. Um, those situations do occur. What I do when that happens is I'll shoot an email to, 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 the, to the BRAP folks and say, hey, I'm gonna be late by a week or two or three. 
Uh, here's why. They'll put a note in NGEMS, your, your BICERC comes in, and you know, you're, you're all good. Uh, in the scenario where you have, let's see, probably the most common thing is with sites that get redeveloped, where your, you know, your entire well network essentially gets blown out while they scrape the site and, you know, put a new building or a new Amazon warehouse up. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, the site's not going to have any wells on it for, you know, it could be a year. Um, that happens. Um, like you, like Rob said, make sure that you are, uh, if it's appropriate, talking to the department about those situations before they happen. So you're sort of factoring in any sensitivities that might be appropriate if there are receptors, et cetera. Um, and make sure you don't miss your buy cert date. Um, explain in your buy cert submission, you know, these are when the wells were abandoned. Uh, these when this is when they're targeted to be reinstalled. Um, Again, if it makes sense, let's say you, you're on a, you know, a four-year monitoring program uh, at that point in your M&A uh, situation, but you haven't sampled for, you know, two years, it may be appropriate um, to grab another round before you abandon all those wells if you're going to miss that next due sampling. So, again, think about that. I think a lot of times the department's looking for uh, the LSRP to justify that there aren't going to be any adverse impacts by not having this sampling data completed. You know, receptor heavy sites, if you're in a site that's got a lot of potable wells in the area uh, or other scenarios where monitoring is, is somewhat important to protect receptors, make sure you address that head on. Make sure you use your multiple lines of evidence or professional judgment to justify why this isn't a concern, why these, why these wells are not in place. And of course, you know, like I said, reach out to BRAP if you've got something really unique that you think makes sense to have a conversation before you make a formal submission. Last slide. So, um, yeah, just please note that if you would like to schedule a technical consultation regarding any of the topics listed, uh, please contact the appropriate individual on this slide. Uh, this list of contacts can also be found on the department's website at the link provided earlier in this presentation under the uh, technical and practicability slide, uh, which I'm sure we can go back to if necessary. Thank you. I think that's it, last slide. Yeah. Maybe we're in, we're in question time, I think, right? Uh, now we're going to move into our final questions portion of the presentation. Uh, just a quick reminder, we, we popped it into the chat a few minutes ago. It appears the SurveyMonkey link for the course evaluation. Um, SurveyMonkey might be down right now. Um, we're asking to please try that link again later and give us your feedback for the presentation from today, as well as for future, future presentations for our use. Another reminder, look out for the email from the LSRPA for CEC certificate access. Um, questions that were not answered today will be answered via email in the coming weeks and slides in the presentation will be posted to the CSRRP training page shortly. So these questions will be geared for Mark, Rob, um, Rich and Dom. Um, the first one, in long screen monitoring wells, for example, 20 feet, where does DEP recommend sampling pumps, et cetera, to be installed? For example, mid-screen, mid-saturated zone, lower permeable zones, et cetera. Who wants to take that? Um, Any? I'll take the first stab at it. Yeah. I think it, when you have scenarios like that, uh, a lot of times, hopefully, you've done some stratified sampling in that wall screen. So you know where the, quote, bias high levels would be within that well screen um, to justify, you know, where do you place your pump as you go forward with your with your permit monitoring. Um, if you don't have that for whatever reason, it's probably a good idea to collect that because it, it could it's probably a question that's gonna come up. Thanks, Mark. Move on to the next question. Uh, zero valent iron is a longer acting remediation, potentially lasting, lasting several years. Could you comment on when would you recommend starting the eight rounds and differentiate the eight rounds from post remediation performance monitoring? If I need to reread that, I will. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll take that one. I, I think you want to consider your type of remediation and how long it's going to have an effect for when you're designing it. Um, you know, if you're up against a remedial time frame and 
we know that your injections are going to cause an influence in groundwater conditions for a number of years that would exceed your time frame, um, you may, may want to adjust and do a shorter or less intrusive injection to shorten that time frame. But, you know, I guess it's hard for us to give a, an idea on when you start that monitoring other than to say, you know, it really should come back to mostly conditions that you had prior to the start of the remediation before you start that monitoring. Yeah, I would think I agree, Rob. I, uh, Rich, I, I think you, 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 it's best to look at pre versus post injection conditions. Look at maybe some secondary or tertiary lines of evidence that might support, okay, when is the ZBI starting to wane a little bit? Um, and, you know, there may be a sort of a gray area, but um, depending upon the level of monitoring that you're doing anyway, you may be able to sort of push the envelope a little bit as to when you sort of make that transition. Uh, worst case, you could always say, look, my ZBI is still working. I'm going to come in for an active permit, and then I'll transition to M&A further down. Oh, hey, this is actual comments off. I just hopped on. I was going to say what Mark just finished with, that you can always, especially if you're using it as a barrier wall or something, you can always incorporate that as part of an active permit. So, and if you're unsure about whether or not you can come in for an active perm or for an M&A wrap after something like that, you could always follow up with uh, one of our geologists in the Bureau of Groundwater Pollution Abatement, and they would be happy to help you out or uh, schedule a technical consultation potentially. The next question, um, when residual product is technically impracticable to remove or treat, will you also have a CEA to cover the zone of technically impractical groundwater remediation? I'll take a first stab at that yeah. unless somebody else wants to. Um, so I think, again, it's, it's one of those types of scenarios that you know, the department will certainly scrutinize uh, pretty carefully. And if you're doing TI, um, you're, you definitely will have to have, you know, that area well defined. And I think that um, the expectation will be, you know, if you can't contain it, um, that, um, like I said, there may be additional monitoring points that you may need to install to satisfy what the department's expectation will be. Hopefully a lot of that would get fleshed out when you're going through the TI process uh, and before you come in for your permit application. I think that's why the recommendation was uh, by a couple folks that, um, you know, with TI, you meet well before you get to the permit submission phase. Yeah, we, we would definitely include the uh, TI issue as part of the CA, and yeah, we would definitely uh, recommend that the you follow the TI guidance on that, and uh, you know we'll do the tech consult, and we'll make sure uh, that you're on the right path. Um, yeah, the, the, it would definitely have to be part of the CEA, and and yeah, some type of containment. Uh, would be necessary or, or, you know, if you have like natural containment, that would have to be demonstrated um, appropriately. Okay. Next question. Uh, when re requesting a technical consultation for a groundwater wrap application for a large complex fractured bedrock site with combined pump and treat and MNA remedy, who at NJDEP should be requested to attend? Um, you, you would reach out to Alexander Shalkanazev, um, and he'll notify all the good people that need to go uh, to to attend. Um, I will say we're currently working on a, the language on the website for technical consultations and uh, assuming that it goes through probably what will be recommended is that if it's an initial groundwater permit where you're coming in for a technical consultation with both like uh, fractured bedrock issues and groundwater permit issues you probably reach out to 
whoever the current contact is for groundwater pollution abatement to set up the technical consultation, which is Marianne Cusick right now, but could be changing in the future. She's recently transitioned to being assistant director. Um, and then just request that representatives from the permitting group be on the call. They'll likely be on the call anyway, but just to be safe, ask that they be included. And then if it's a case where you already had permit applications that you've either that you've had to withdraw in the past and you're responding to technical deficiencies that were noted in a letter by BRAP, then the technical consultation request should probably come to whoever the uh, technical consultation representative is for BRAP, which right now is me. Uh, but if you, when you're setting up your technical consultation, just go on our website and go to the technical consultation link and there should be current information on who to contact and how to do it. Great, thank you. The next question, aren't ticks compared to the total to the total and individual interim criteria based on their carcinogenicity? Uh, I believe they are because the way the groundwater quality standards are written, I think for ones that are suspected carcinogens, I think the individual tick concentration is lower uh, in those scenarios. So uh, look at the look at the rule, but I don't know if, the, if you have any clarification on that. That's my recollection without the, the, the regulation. Generally, we generally we use the non-carcinogenic standard. Uh, that's not always the case. It really depends on what the ticks are. Um, again, ticks are kind of like an evolving thing, so. Um, yeah, the, the only thing I'll, I, oh, sorry, Rob. No, I was just no. gonna, I was just gonna say that if you do have known carcinogens, then you have to compare to the, uh, the carcinogenic, uh, interim specific groundwater criteria. There is a different number for total and individual. It goes down from 500 and 100 to 25 and 5. But most of the time when you're working with ticks, we're assuming that they're non-carcinogenic. Yeah, I'm trying to encounter a, a scenario where I've encountered a, quote, suspected carcinogen tick. I don't know if I can recall it, right? Yeah. A few more questions about relating to ticks. Is the total ticks interim criteria of 500 micrograms per liter for SVOC and VOC ticks combined or separate? It's combined. Yeah. So you take uh, the, the 15 ticks that you get from your VO scan and the 15 ticks that you get from your SVOC tick scan and, and whatever the total that comes out from the lab and you add them together and then compare that total to 500. And those are probably the scenarios where, you know, talking to a chemist and looking at those ticks more critically becomes more important. You can get, you know, what I like to term creative uh, in scenarios like that, as, as long as you're coming within the, the guardrails that the department has. Um, and again, like Robert said, it, it's kind of an evolving thing as more and more of these tick sites come through the system. I think people are trying to figure out ways to, to best manage those. Um, so, uh, and again, I think Greg Defoe is a good resource. We had a, a case with Rob actually, where we went through a, a gyration like that, where we were adding and uh, subtracting ticks and, and, you know, we worked with the department to come up with something that, that made sense for our specific site. When calculating the total tick concentration, do I sum all the ticks in the lab report or just the 15 highest? Just in the just the 15 they are required to um, send data for um, the 15 highest. Uh, what about ticks in PL1? So class one Pinelands area. I'm not sure if we touched on this yet. So ticks in the Pinelands. Um, it's not really. a true standard for ticks in the pylons. We, we, um, we like to 
um, as it's kind of like a policy where each tick shouldn't be above an assumed PQL of one microgram per liter. Um, there isn't a total tick standard that's applicable for the pinelands. You would just look at each individual tick and make sure that none of them are above the applicable, uh, make sure they're not above one microgram per liter. So in that instance, on your CA fact sheet, you would just put individual ticks. Um, you wouldn't have total ticks. And it might be one of those scenarios too, where you, you might want to tech consult, you might want to have some conversations with the department about that particular scenario because, you know, you might be monitoring forever in certain situations. You want to try to avoid that. And again, if you can get some intel from the department about what makes sense based upon your site specifics, that may work to your advantage or not. With regards to groundwater wrap termination, is the CEA lifted first, followed by the wrap termination, and then the monitoring wells are properly abandoned? Does any well abandonment report go to the department? Procedurally, I mean, go ahead, Rob. If you want to answer, go go for it. The, um, yeah, the, I'll answer that one. The okay. groundwater wrap uh, gets terminated, and as part of that termination, we send the groundwater wrap termination letter, and that includes uh, the CEA. So as opposed to where you could be in a LSR and you have a CA before you get to a wrap, that would require a CA lift. But once you're in a wrap, it's a wrap termination application. And that, as part of that, we send out a wrap termination letter, which includes the lifting of the CEA. So, so the, LSR, uh, the applicant doesn't have to do anything else other than submit the termination, right, Mike? Correct. Yep, and then as part of uh, that termination letter, we have language in there about uh, sealing the wells and, and where to send that documentation uh, to the department. So we always recommend not to to uh, seal the wells until you get that termination uh, letter. Sound advice. All right. Hey, I'm just going to interrupt. Um, it is 1257, so we are basically out of time for questions. A lot of questions went unanswered, but as always, they'll be answered um, via email directly to you in the coming weeks. Um, we just want to thank you all for coming to this training and thank you all of our pre presenters for doing this for us today. Um, also, our survey monkey, is, the site is working again, so please do fill out the survey. I'll put the link in the chat one more time for you. It really helps us to know what you found helpful, not helpful, or what you would like to see in the future. Um, so thank you all. Um, that's it for today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.